Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to the um, conference, Traded Com 2022. And uh, um, we'll be able to so at the beginning of this conference. We'll start with the current chair. Um, our uh, general chair, Professor um, Shoyu, is not um, be able to come in at this conference. So for me, I'm the um, general co-chair, Dr. Bruce Gu from Victoria University. I will represent um, on behalf of the entire organizing and steering committee and to present this opening speech. When for today, uh, from 10 to 10.05, that will be opening speech, 10.05 10 to 10. Um, Past ten, that will be a welcome message from the AI um, committee, and then we will have our uh, we will have our keynote um, speech by Dr. Lee Wei, and then we will start up with our morning session um, conference. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thanks um, on behalf of the Open Up um, and the Steering Committees. It's my greatest pleasure and privilege to welcome you to the seventeenth AI International Conference. Um, implementation and the verification of emerging information technologies. Um, eventually, this is the second year Trinity Con conference held in virtual format. When COVID uh, and less of travelers are restricted, the technologies give us the opportunity to share our knowledge and present our work using virtual platforms. And the safety and well-being um, of all conference participants is our top priority. Before giving the floor, to welcome addresses and the keynote speakers. Um, I will take the opportunity to make some general remarks and touch briefly on the Trinity Council 2022. The scope of the conference will cover the current and emerging aspects of all technologies, as the Internet of Things, um, edge computing, cloud computing, port computing, industry 4.0, edge AI, machine learning, cyber security, and computer communications. Uh, we express our deep gratitude to, um, to the conference organizer, EAI, and the entire organizing committee team or work together and extremely hard for goal and to prepare an outstanding conference. As a result, we have prepared a keynote speak um, and a technical session to discuss the challenges, opportunities, and problems of the application in various fields. And then we also express our um, thankful gratitude to our international peer reviewers team. We volunteered and allocated a big chunk of their private time from BusyWorks to review papers. There's a part of um, hard time we all are experiencing. Their contributions is invaluable. Many thanks to uh, to you, uh, all, all of our authors, for your excellent contributions through submitting your papers to the conference. Um, I also would like to express our deep gratitude to our keynote speaker, Dr. Wei Ni, who is the principal research scientist um, of the Information Security and Privacy Group, ISP, in CISWO. We highly appreciate that you spent your time to share your expertise and knowledge with, your, with our audience. In this conference, uh, we have received over um, uh, 30 submissions, and the acceptance rate for the conference is um, about. And uh, thanks for all this for your contributions. And uh, um, this is something of this. Um, uh, these years happened, wars, global conflicts, and um, epidemics are most in the history of humanity, but uh, at the same time, the facilitated the technological revolution in many areas, including healthcare. Uh, some can be mapped to the COVID-19 crisis. Um, I would agree we all had a uh, continue to experience challenging times with many restrictions applied. At the same time, the pandemic has proven um, the value and the power of technology of humanity. Technology create and alive day to day life. Um, even our most relevant uh, sectors of digital transformations became its uh, advocates. Other people became more rapidly growing classes of users of, uh, for online services, food deliveries, online banking, telehealth, video conferencing. Um, yeah, I'm not going uh, to spend too much time in the uh, opening speech. Um, so while I'm concluding, I'll take the opportunity to welcome each of you and agreeing to participate in these uh, 17 Australia to come to 2022. We hope you return next year with the, even more um, colleagues for 18th Australia to come 2023. 
which we hope very much will be held in a traditional face-to-face -face format and that the world will return to the normal. And I enjoy your participation in the Trinity Conference. And thank you. Have a wonderful conference day. And then next, um, it will be an official welcome from EAI. We will need to, um, uh, there's a welcome video provided by EAI Community Conference Manager, um, Ivana, and I will play the, um, quickly pro uh, provided the um, welcome video from her, and then we will pass the mic to our um, um, keynote speaker. Thank you. the conference manager of this year's edition of the event. I would like to address all of you on behalf I would like to thank all of you for being a part of this conference and for your involvement with the AI. Above all, I would like to thank the general chairs and the whole organizing committee for their excellent work during the conference preparation. I invite you to join us again next year at the EAI Trident Com 2023. We will keep you updated and the news about the event will be announced on the conference website soon. Should you be interested in becoming a part of the next year's conference, please do not hesitate to contact us at the email address below. If you are interested in discussing other possible cooperation, a conference, a workshop, or a new event altogether, please contact us at this email address as well. Thank you for your attention and enjoy the conference. Thank you. Um, the quick welcome message from the um, EI conference community. And I will pass the mic to our keynote speaker, Dr. Waini. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Professor Shui, for this uh, um, introduction. So now let me share my screen. So is my screen visible? Yes, we are. I think yes, it's visible. It. Thanks. Uh, let me, so just check, uh, are we on the first page? Oh, no, now I'm on the second page outline, correct? Uh, uh, no, it's no. still on the okay. first page. Let, I let, think. let me reshare my screen. I guess I share the incorrect screen. How about now? Am I in the second screen? Yeah, you can see outline. the outline page, yeah. Uh, that's great. Uh. So, Okay, thank you very much for your kind of invitation, uh, Professor Shui and also uh, Dr. Yu Yang. Um, as introduced, uh, uh, this is the way I'm a research scientist uh, in CSIRO uh, with focus on the security and the privacy. I'm uh, also a chapter chair of uh, IEEE VTS uh, Vehicular Technology Society New South Wales chapter. And meanwhile, I've been working with a number of uh, universities in Sydney. And uh, um, so it's a really good uh, Cyro and the universities to work together and they got strong support. The, top, the title of my talk for today is Connected and Trusted Intelligence for Future Digital Transportation. When we say connected, it's obviously networks are increasingly connected, the vehicles are increasingly connected. But on the other hand, trust is a really a big thing um, to provide us a secure, reliable, and digital transportation system in the future. Now I am on the second page. This is an outline of my talk for today. First, I will talk about the digital driven, um, the data driven digital transportation system. And then I will uh, describe a few research challenges uh, we encountered so far and the research focuses so we conducted to address these challenges. I will conclude my talk by pointing out the way I believe we could move together and forward. On this page, I'm showing a overview of this digital transportation system. So digital transportation system looks like an ecosystem where 
we could have the state of art sensors um, in at different parts of the network, road networks, or even inside the building uh, to collect uh, useful passenger or pedestrian information, density, crowd. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, all this information will be collected uh, through different network infrastructure. Uh, in road network, we might use 4G, 5G, and potentially 6G by 2030. Um, in, inside the uh, um, building, we might have Wi-Fi and other network facility to connect those useful data captured by state-of-the-art sensors. All this data will be collected in cloud um, infrastructure or facility and could be processed by using cloud computing. But also more increasingly, we can use pervasive computing, edge computing, and fog computing so that data could be quickly processed at a point of capture and so that a faster response could be fed back towards the sensors or actuators inside the road network. As I'm showing here, um, let me show my curse. As I'm showing here, uh, the data could be used to support a mobility of service and it could also be used to implement network control. For example, control the traffic light or control um, the speed uh, limit of different uh, road sectors based on the, how many traffic is, how many cars in this particular road sector. And also can be used to maintain or schedule the maintenance of road work. We, I believe we all have very bad experience where uh, you got a road maintenance happening in the middle of a rush hour and the long queues has to be uh, waiting uh, say get uh, until the ro road management or road maintenance is done. So by using data, we could potentially forecast the traffic flow at a different time on different days, and then find the best, uh, best uh, least uh, uh, sort of uh, impactful time to carry out uh, this uh, road management or uh, road maintenance. All these uh, actions uh, could uh, potentially improve the operation of a road network in the longer term. So with the feedback towards the road network for sustainability and the reliability, and also of course, safety. So digital transportation system actually is beyond the digital transportation system. First, digital transportation system, it's alone, is a, is a really a bigger and a, a in, in impactful area. For example, the Australian Bureau of Infrastructure, Transport and uh, Regional Development estimated that the congestion cost Australia about $16 billion in 2015 alone. And the estimation will be uh, without a major policy changes, um, the congestion costs are expected to be $37 billion by 2030. And uh, to relieve or, or reduce uh, this congestion cost, uh, one way is to, of course, uh, we heavily invest on the road network infrastructure. We could experience a very painful multi-year experience uh, until the road network uh, is uh, up upgraded. Uh, um, but alternative way is uh, we might want to improve the current utilization or utilization of the current road network by digitizing or by using big data analytics capability. In that case, as I mentioned on the previous page, the data state of our art sensing capability could capture useful data and the state of art data analytics capability could really draw the insights from the data to find the best way to mobilize traffic, to mobilize passenger, to make it utilize good utilization of the current public transportation so that there's no need to relocate the people or carry out a bigger scale road and the transport transportation conjunction. But on the other hand, um, the digital transportation system could have a strong similarity on several very important topics relevant to Australia. 
One of the important topics is the supply chain's integrity, which is also known as a brand Australian. Australia is known to produce a high quality premium food, for example, our beef, our milk, and also different fruits. Uh, in, in that case, actually, one biggest uh, situation we've been confronting is uh, uh, many of uh, so-called Australian food in overseas markets actually was not from Australia. Take uh, honey, for example, Tasmania produced a high quality or top quality honey exported around the world. But what we notice from market analysis is actually there's a 10 times more so-called Australian market is, a sell, is a being sold internationally compared to the uh, honey was really produced in Tasmania. So this is the scale where we are looking at the counterfeiting in overseas market. This could have a strong impact in the reputation of Australian food and also have a strong impact on the price of premium we try to um, charge on our quality food. Um, one of uh, CSRO's uh, uh, mission is to launch trusted agriculture and food. In that case, uh, CSRO been consulting with the industrial sector and the government and uh, developed a roadmap to use uh, state-of-art technologies to protect our reputation and protect uh, the profit of Australian farmer. Another important area uh, closer related to the digital transportation system is a circular, circular economy. So circular economy is increasingly important in the past several years because of some export ban of uh, the export of Australian uh, waste and also because uh, uh, the current uh, initiative uh, of reducing the land view. Uh, you may aware, you may be aware actually across uh, almost all the states in Australia, we got a container dis disposed scheme. In that case, uh, federal government or uh, different state government are encouraging uh, people, individuals like you and myself to recycle our bottles and uh, so that uh, these bottles could go back to the uh, production or manufacturing uh, to be reused. Um, right now, Every year we got a 90 billion tons of raw materials or original materials being used to project, produce plastics, but only less than 9% are being re recycled. And the rest of the uh, plastics typically ended up uh, in landfill. And uh, in Australia's case, a lot of waste plastic bottles, they end up uh, on our beach or inside uh, in the ocean around us. And this could have a significant toll in our hills and also in the environment. That's why recycling is really a bigger topic in the next decade. And uh, uh, digitization could contribute substantially to um, improve the recycling rate, reducing the uh, land field. All these uh, topics are closely related to each other on the digitization of larger scale systems or digital transportation system or food logistical tracking system or the recycling material tracking system. That's why they closely connected and all have a significant impact in the next decade or to come. So a few research challenges actually we spotted during our investigation on the digital transportation. One of the top challenges is the trust itself inside the data we captured. The other one is the trust in the way we handle this data. Um, in, in accordance with uh, these uh, different challenges, actually we got a, a number of initiatives or bigger research programs to uh, address these challenges at different stages and the scenarios. The first project or activity we carry out in CIRO is about secure data 
uh, achieve, achieve the provenance of data in airplane. This is a very important part of a transportation system with a strong requirement on reliability, security, and the safety. So the statement we want to make is actually data can only be trusted if it is a, we know where it is collected, we know when it is collected, and we know the, the device collecting it is reliable and, uh, and uh, uh, trustworthy. In this case, the scenario is in the inside the aircraft. Um, inside the aircraft, we got a quite a good number of uh, safety gears. For example, oxygen um, canister or oxygen bottles, life jacket. Right, or, and also oxygen masks. Actually, to everybody's surprise, I suppose here, um, life jacket or oxygen canister are very good souvenirs to many of the passengers. So there is an official process in different, in all the airlines to check if every of each of these life jacket is in place after passengers leave the airplane and before the new passengers get on board. So this process is lengthy, and right now it needs to be done manually. And of course, it will involve um, human entry of data into the system. Um, and this could also incur sort of human errors. So we've been work, working with Boeing and try to address this by using digitization to achieve autonomous detection of a, um, of different uh, safety gears. And uh, so that uh, this thing can be quickly done and uh, the delay in airport will be much, much faster. So turnaround time of aircraft could be substantially reduced. So to achieve this, actually what we are, uh, what we propose is actually try to reuse the Wi-Fi entertainment system inside the aircraft. You may be aware Wi-Fi devices are actually being widely deployed inside the aircraft. And this system typically used of, say, for entertainment. But also increasingly, mobile phone is allowed inside many of the airline aircrafts. For example, um, Qantas, you could use your own mobile phone connected to the cabin Wi-Fi to enjoy their entertainment system, watching movies, for example. In that case, the Wi-Fi signal emitted by your mobile phone or by the entertainment system inside the aircraft could be used to locate uh, uh, different seats or different uh, uh, gears. On the other hand, there's also fairly low cost uh, miniature sized Wi-Fi transmitters available on the market. This device got a long battery time and could be used as a tag to be attached to life jacket or, or oxygen chemist. So then what we did is actually we think about uh, uh, develop uh, a number of uh, Wi-Fi sniffers inside the aircraft. These sniffers are consistently listening to all the Wi-Fi transmitters inside the aircraft, in particular, this uh, uh, the small uh, life jacket uh, uh, Wi-Fi tags and uh, oxygen canister Wi-Fi tags. And by collecting their um, signal strengths and also allow this Wi-Fi device uh, um, listen to each other, report their signal strengths between each pair of them, we can create a multi-dimensional graph and, uh, and using graph matching method to match this collected signal graph towards the original relative location of all the Wi-Fi devices inside the aircraft. By doing this, so we could validate and say, hey, yes, all the devices are, are at the original location they're supposed to be, and no device are being tampered or removed um, from, the, from the aircraft. We carried out a quite extensive experiment in real world environment. Um, together with Boeing, we placed our, some Wi-Fi sniffers uh, inside uh, an aircraft in Brisbane. So what are you seeing here on this page? We place uh, a number of Wi-Fi devices underneath the seat 
or at the back of the cabin or in the front of the cabin. And all those Wi-Fi devices, as I said, they can transmit to each other and be used to collaboratively lo lo localize themselves. And the lo localized information will be recorded at a database inside the cockpit and uh, so that the pilot can get a full control or awareness of the situation inside the aircraft. So as I'm showing here, the, our algorithm and the method substantially outperform all the existing technologies and achieve almost 100% accuracy in terms of the location of different Wi-Fi devices. I would mention the reason we use Wi-Fi devices here is, the, is a real world consideration in uh, aircraft or in aviation industry. So the, by using state of, uh, by using the commercial offshore of Wi-Fi devices, we basically could avoid uh, uh, introducing new cables into aircraft or new electronics into aircraft, uh, which would otherwise uh, lead to substantial and lengthy certification process. The reason is aircraft is highly required to be reliable, safety, and all the certification of a new electronics could uh, take uh, years, uh, if not months. Okay. So the other part of our data collection exercise is showing here. The digital transportation system, in particular, we're talking about a public transportation system um, could have been substantially more efficient if data analytics uh, is introduced. What you are looking at right now is uh, the platform of uh, railway stations. What you are seeing these red small dots are the passengers waiting in their trains to come. And uh, the distribution of different passengers is uh, a very good indicator of uh, um, the traffic demand of uh, particular uh, railway uh, train, train. Another important part is uh, the density of uh, passengers on a particular platform could have uh, um, impact on the secu security and the safety, right? For example, look at uh, platform two and one, we are seeing there are too many passengers over there and uh, there could be emerging situation uh, if we're not uh, say dealt with uh, in time and the Delta is in a safety in a safe manner. That's why we believe uh, uh, the real-time awareness of the crowd of how many people on a different platform and which train they are waiting for at a different moment could have a strong application to improve the efficiency of a railway, a railway system and also improve the safety and the security um, for public uh, um, security and public good. So in that case, what we propose is uh, we propose to install several Wi-Fi sniffers to listen to the transmission of the Wi-Fi devices on the platform. In this case, the Wi-Fi devices can be your mobile phone. Uh, Wi-Fi capability has been increasingly in equipped at uh, um, and our mobile phone device or smart device like an iPad or computers. And our device, say our Wi-Fi sniffers can listen to the MAC address of different Wi-Fi devices and start to estimate the location of those Wi-Fi devices. And the reason we use a MAC address is because we do have this security and the privacy concern. So by only reading MAC address, we do not decrypt the data part of uh, uh, your mobile phone. Um, meanwhile, we could get a reasonably good accuracy. I should mention here, all this Wi-Fi device uh, we are talking about are passive. So um, our Wi-Fi devices here showing uh, just listen. They do not generate additional traffic. Um, by this means, uh, they can literally listen to all the Wi-Fi devices, or all the mobile phones emitting energy in the platform. And uh, um, we can support a, a larger number of uh, um, 
targets or objects be monitored at the same time. And this is a, a video clip we recorded uh, during our experiment test uh, for the system I just described. On the screen, we got a, a colleague from um, another organization test our solution. We used our lecture theater as the testing scenario. The reason is because the, the seeds in the lecture theater, which is a blue dot on the, on the image here, are typically uh, one meter apart. So as shown on the figure or on the video, uh, the target, which is a red dot, moving between the rows of seeds, uh, indicating we can achieve uh, an accuracy about one meter. This is a fairly good uh, and a decent accuracy and it could be used to estimate the crowd density on uh, railway platforms. Given the fact that typical railway platform are about five meters in width. So the next research challenge, as I mentioned, is the trust in handling data. In that case, uh, when we talk about a digital uh, transportation system, a very important component is the future autonomous vehicles. In that case, we could talk about a large number of vehicles collect, got a sensing capability and the communication capability. They can talk to each other, but they also can talk to the network infrastructure. One important role this uh, device or these uh, vehicles uh, is taking is uh, they capture their environmental sensing results and that they would generate machine learning based insights to help them to navigate through a difficult traffic condition or navigate in city environment. In that case, machine learning and the autonomous vehicle are perfect match. Um, federated learning got a very good potential in, in particular because we got a larger number of vehicles and we want to allow these vehicles to get a good um, sort of insight of what's happening on the other part of the city, which they might want to travel to, right? But the bottleneck of federated learning is uh, the uploading um, bandwidth consumption of their local models. In traditional federated learning, each of the vehicles have to uh, upload one model after the other, and their local models uh, then can be aggregated at the base station or server to generate a global model. And then the global model can be replied to all the vehicles for their navigation control. But in the over air federal learning, all these vehicles can transmit at the same time using the same radio frequency and the time resources. And then the model could naturally combine and aggregate that in the radio air interface. The global model will be quickly which achieved at the, the base station. What the base station needs to do is just to replay the model and send the model to everybody, every each of the vehicles. So this is a, a energy and a spectrum efficient solution to allow autonomous vehicles to collaboratively learn global models. But the limitation here is also obvious. Different from conventional federated learning, uh, over the air federated learning would make the local model of individual vehicles uh, obsolete. The reason is obvious because the base station would only receive this aggregated model where each local model is no longer visible. And the, the possible consequence is that uh, this system would be particularly vulnerable towards a model poisoning attack. If one or multiple of the vehicles decided to uh, manipulate the system by transmitting a um, contaminated model trained by contaminated data, or even just simply transmitting some um, fabricated model with no data substantial, then the entire um, control system running based on the global model could be sabotaged. The safety couldn't have been secured or guaranteed. So to do this, actually what we propose to do is uh, propose a new 
a framework which can balance between the learning accuracy of the over air um, federated learning, will retain the integrity, retain the um, capability of the base station to access and uh, assess individual global models. By doing this, the integrity of the network can be guaranteed. The, the key idea is actually, while we still running the uh, over the air federated learning um, in the system, we would allow the base station to carry out a serial interference cancellation method so that the base station can cancel, uh, can detect one local model after the other by cancellation. So in more, more explicitly, so the base station could have detected the first uh, local model from the vehicle, from one of the vehicles, and then cancel it from the received uh, global model, and uh, then recover the second. By doing this, uh, um, by doing this uh, you know, can, uh, uh, repeatedly, each of these local models can be extracted. And uh, given the local model, um, the base station can take uh, all different uh, methods to um, assess uh, its uh, um, reliability. For example, multi crown method being used uh, for federated learning that will be applicable here. A little bit of mathematics here. So as I'm showing here, the overall objective of this design is to minimize the distortion of this aggregated global model. So the objective function I'm showing here is the uh, mean square error of this aggregated model at the base station, in which B is the post-processing um, vector at the base station, while AK is the pre-processing vector used at, at a vehicle A, a vehicle K. So by optimizing B and A, the post-processing and the uh, pre-processing vectors, we could uh, minimize this uh, um, bias or distortion of the global model at the base station. But the optimization is a subject to the objective uh, accountant, where we want to retain the uh, retain the base station's capability of extracting each local models. To do that, we basically require the receive the uh, uh, inside the, the global model, the local model of a particular user supposed to be stronger than the rest of the users. So we could extract it. And then we could do repeating doing this by extracting the second strongest local model, so the strongest local model. This is what this constraint would allow us to do. So essentially, uh, the current strongest local model needs to be uh, stronger than the total of all the rest of the model. Uh, and the difference needs to be larger than a predefined threshold. The threshold will be carefully selected so that each of these detected local models can still be fully recovered and can go through a chrome or multi-chrome detection to check the, uh, check the potential attacks. We got some uh, numerical results in that case. Basically, what we're showing is uh, by introducing this uh, new mechanism, the global model of uh, over the AI federal learning could uh, still converge uh, fairly nicely. The only penalty we could uh, see is actually the transmit power of the vehicles needs uh, to go up a little bit. Um, but I think uh, this is the cost so you, we have to pay to achieve a secure uh, over air federated learning model for autonomous vehicles. Okay, um, so next I will talk about the next stage we want to achieve. Given the data uh, we could trust, given the process we could trust, now we come back to the big picture. How can we use this uh, data and the method to improve uh, the future network uh, management for digital transportation system. Again, come back to this uh, um, digital system ecosystem, uh, ecosystem. Now the plan for us could be 
we might start to think about uh, machine learning methods or data analytics techniques to um, draw useful insights from the data captured. Uh, in that case, we could carefully design the federated learning model, which each of the vehicles would learn. And we could design the data analytics model at the control center of a digital transportation system. Uh, one example is uh, by gaining the insights from the data, we could uh, in real time control traffic light. We could uh, control or adjust the speed limit of different road sectors based on the, the number of vehicles using that particular road sector. We could also support mobility as service in that case, because uh, given the data, you got a good estimation um, of uh, traffic flow in public transportation system, and uh, the mobility as service could be substantially improved in terms of efficiency. Of course, uh, the data could give us uh, a good prediction of an open window where a particular side of, side of a road uh, and could have uh, an up upgrade or maintenance work with the least uh, intervention or inter interruption towards a typical road traffic. So all of these require trusted data, trusted machine learning method, uh, and the trusted data handling process. Also, the way forward. As uh, discussed so far, we basically talked about the data part, but uh, we couldn't uh, um, be successful without uh, collaborating with a bigger community. In that case, apart from the data acquisition and the machine learning feature extraction, we probably need to work with the autonomous and the control part, right? Or autonomous vehicle to understand what will be the model most useful for over the air battery to learning, we have to work with the cyber security and the privacy, especially when we say we want to monitor the uh, passenger, passenger density in our railway stations, then potentially we could compromise the privacy of individual passengers. We have to work with the civil engineering because uh, some of the data could be useful to help uh, town designers to improve their future design. In addition, we have to work with industrial, of course, because uh, we couldn't achieve our research vision without uh, manufacturing capability. We have to work with the public community to gain their feedback of what the system, public transportation system in particular, uh, we want to achieve. International standard is important because our transportation system need to have a good uh, compatibility at an international stage. For example, aircraft that we are talking about, they're flying all, everywhere. So we want to have consistent uh, safety measure and the security measure and the efficiency measure to the system we are going to design. Policy maker and the regulator will be another important factor in the system we are talking about, um, of course, because they will have a strong, they will be a strong advocate once the value of a digitization um, is, uh, is exposed or achieved. And also they will help connect the different pieces like a circular economy or trust their trust supply chain together with the digital transportation and to make a, a, a more comprehensive and holistic design. I want to conclude my talk by showing a quick video clip. So this is a video clip uh, talking about a system we developed uh, in the past uh, on the digital transportation and, and, uh, and uh, uh, also got a fairly successful commercialization experience in it. We developed an underground localization and the communication and the data analytics platform, which is called a uh, WASP. Uh, wireless uh, ad hoc uh, system for positioning. So the platform uh, got a, so it make, is made of a large number of uh, sensing nodes and uh, can be deployed in underground mining environment. And uh, these sensors would collectively locate uh, 
uh, mining vehicles and uh, also uh, pass or transmit this um, mining vehicles localization information all the way to the control room uh, through multiple connections. And uh, then data analytics method is uh, utilized based on the trajectory uh, information based on the traffic flow in different sector of the underground mines and uh, to predict the traffic. So this is important uh, in particular in underground mining environment because uh, the mining equipment vehicles are huge, heavy devices and, and drive, uh, truck drivers are typically very poor sort of visibility around it. So a good prediction of where they are and where the other vehicles are and where the passenger potentially other miners are is really critical for the safety and the efficiency of mining in operation and, uh, and uh, management. So this uh, system has been commercialized by the company called MindTech, as I mentioned, and it's uh, sold uh, internationally. It uh, has been deployed uh, in Australia, including several very harsh mining environment, and also been sold uh, into uh, North America, Europe, and uh, Malay, some Asian market. Recently, the company Mantech, um, commercial, which commercialized our technology, uh, has been acquired by the world leading uh, mining equipment manufacturer called uh, Caterpillar. So this is a good story showing how quality research could end up uh, uh, with a global impact and uh, also help uh, improve the safety, efficiency of uh, real world applications. Um, I probably just stop here. On this page, there are some um, papers relevant to the talk. And uh, of course, I can share with the papers if you guys are interested in it. Uh, thank you very much. So is there any questions? And thanks, Wei, for the great presentation. Uh, any question from our audience? Yeah, uh, just uh, got a um, point of interest with your work. I think your work is uh, very solid um, and very useful to the real world. But I'm just say uh, wondering if that's applicable um, or to say associate with the blockchain features inside your um, work have done. Because I previously have done a work that's associating the federated learning together with the blockchain to enhance the overall security level. So I'm just uh, wondering if your work is uh, associable with uh, some like the blockchain techniques or some, some further usages. Yep, thanks. Uh, thank you. Very good uh, point uh, you asked. Actually, we do have uh, a number of blockchain activities. And um, in particular, we got a, uh, we connect the blockchain strongly with a circular economy. Right? In that uh, situation, uh, we, the digitization system, which uh, digitize all the recycling material, waste, uh, and the stored material inside the blockchain and a smart contract have been created to certify the materials. The scenario we are talking about here, and actually it's a real world scenario. So uh, in the recycling sector, you may acquire a bigger chunk, of, a bigger amount of recycling material, a particular type of plastics. And this material will be decomposed and uh, divided into, into small pieces and uh, end up uh, in different uh, new products. For example, your, your, uh, your cup, right? Potentially you, you got uh, many bottles coming out of from uh, some other, many, a lot of bottles as well. So in that case, the blockchain technology we develop essentially certify, yes, this uh, cup, this, uh, this bottle I, I got, is from a big amount of uh, material recycled on one day, right? So this is uh, how blockchain will be used. On the other hand, the federated learning, we 
Um, we also been thinking of uh, the um, merger or integration of federated learning into the blockchain secu security scenario uh, so that uh, um, the learning result uh, or learning experience, even the data used uh, for the different uh, federated learning entities will be secured in the blockchain and it could be used uh, in the future to assess the integrity of the model uh, we got uh, from the federated learning. So that's uh, pretty much we, we've been working in this space. Yep, I think that is so much of my questions. Thanks for answering. Yep. Thank you. Thanks. Any further questions for Wei? This is a great opportunity. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. This is Tony here. Uh, thank you so much, Wei. That's quite an important um, speech. I just want to ask, uh, can you share your insight with um, in the federated uh, network? How can we improve the communication efficiency? Because I think there's a lot like a, a bottleneck um, in the federated uh, learning. I thank you. Thank you, Tony, for this question. Um, yes, um, I, I think uh, we got a multiple bottlenecks uh, in federated learning um, scenario, um, including computing power, including trustworthiness, uh, including security, uh, of course, including the trans transmission, in particular transmission. Because the idea of federated learning in the, in, say, in the wireless uh, scenario, if we do want to implement uh, this uh, um, autonomous vehicle with a federated uh, data learning and management, we want to have a good uh, reliable communication scheme. So over, over, over the air transmission could be a good solution, as I mentioned. Um, the limitation, the, the benefit is it could accommodate a larger number of devices to transmit in the same time. The limitation, as already mentioned, is the security uh, side. But we got some initial result and the solution for it. Um, of course, another pot possible risk for over-the-air federated learning will be the uh, electronics design, because uh, it's a very much uh, an analog-based uh, model aggregation. So it would require high precision receiver at the base station side so that each of the local models could have been um, after aggregation could be ac accurately captured. Apart from over the air federal learning, I think we also got other options. For example, uh, we could think about a conventional federal learning, but uh, together with a model cleaning or model pruning, right? So we, for the users or vehicles uh, has have a higher um, importance or priority uh, or say they have high reliability trustworthiness. In that case, uh, the model, local model they learned could have been given higher weight or even higher priority compared to other less trustworthy vehicles. In that case, we could uh, allow the other vehicles to prune their model to greatest extent. So showing, just showing us the most important neurons weight, don't bother to send us everything, right? By doing this, we could substantially reduce um, the overhead of uh, model aggregation if we're using conventional uh, federated learning. Of course, there's uh, other um, possible solutions. So for example, Asynchronized federated learning. In that case, uh, model each local model or each local agent only need to synchronize with the global model occasionally. There's no need to wait for other models to mature. And uh, this basically allow the model, uh, allow different users to transmit at a different time, but still guarantee the convergence of the model. So there, there is different ways I can see we can find the reasonable solution for it. 
in a slightly distant space to what we just discussed. Um, in the physical layer, there is an optimization effort and try to uh, optimize the transmitter power or, or resource, uh, radio resource usage to maximize the reliability or convergence of a federated learning. So uh, in that case, uh, basically, uh, we can find the most delicate design of the transmitter power of local models to accommodate more models in the same uh, federated learning framework. But on the other hand, as I, I would emphasize, this is a very, very new area. This solution I just described are, are still immature in their infancy stage. So the plenty research opportunity for all of us. Thank you very much, appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Wei, and thanks uh, for the questions from our audience. And due to time eliminations, uh, we may not have another question for, for, for you guys. Uh, thanks again, Wei, for taking your time presenting your advanced research and the results with us. And uh, may I hand it over to Bruce so we can move, over, uh, move forward to the next stage? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wei. Thank you, um, Dr. Yuriel. And uh, um, so now it's um, pretty much 11 o'clock in the Melbourne. So we'll start our morning technical session. Um, our first paper, we will start to present the paper. Um, our first paper was present, uh, the title for the paper is FS, uh, FSDM, Federated and Supported uh, to Machine for Smart City. Also for that paper is um, Li Chuan Ma, um, Jin Ji Pei from Sydney University, Long Jiang Gao from Chilu University of Technology, and uh, Ling Ding from Data 616 from Australia. And the authors are not here today um, due to the time difference, the um, overseas authors. And they will play, they sent us the short video, we'll play the video for the presenters. And uh, let me share the video. Today, I would like to present this paper, FSVM Federative Support Vector Machine for Smart City. This report consists of four parts, which are motivation, algorithm, evaluation, and conclusion. The first part is motivation. In the real scene, there is a problem that the training sample set is huge and the data itself is collecting and store in a distributed way. The hardware of a single machine cannot support the requirement of direct operation on all data. And it is difficult to ensure the accuracy of classification result of the algorithm. In this scenario, the parallel and distributed algorithm will be very effective. With the advantage of multi-core, the support vector machine algorithm can be applied on a large scale to improve the efficiency of the algorithm. At the same time, the data used for training is owned by multiple entities, and the sensitivity of the data prevents data sharing and training. Therefore, we consider the distributed support vector machine scenario. ADNM algorithm is used for solve the optimization problem and cryptography is introduced to protect privacy. In many studies, multiple entities solve problems in a distributed way. Each entity processes subset of data locally and cooperates to obtain the final training model. In this context, it is necessary for many parties to solve the optimization problem defined by SVM without disclosing the original data. By using ADM algorithm to solve the support vector machine model in the multi-data source scenario, a large problem is divided into several small problems that can be solved at the same time in a distributed way. And the final optimal solution is obtained by participating in the parameter interaction 
between entities. However, it is far from enough for privacy protection to store the original data locally. It is necessary to protect the privacy of the interaction parameters in the implementation of ADMM algorithm. To this end, it is necessary to combine secure multi-party computing technology and secret sharing. Propose an ADMM algorithm to achieve privacy protection. Ensure the privacy protection problem in the distributed implementation process of support vector machines. Conduct corroborative computing in the scenario where multiple participants do not trust each other. And ensure that each agent can only get the final classification result, but not the state information of other agent. In terms of the above key issues, four tells they are particularly relevant to BSC, at least in the research data court. The advantage of paper one is that in several set studies, the privacy protection scenario of support vector machine is only a distributed deployment of data, but it is still trained by a single machine and does not make full use of computing power of different entities in this distributed scenario in the age of big data to carry out collaborative training. Paper 2 proposed this distributed support vector machine algorithm, but does not involve privacy protection. Paper 3 is about median differential privacy. Relatively speaking, it is indistinguishable from individuals, but it will still reveal the statistical characteristic of user groups. In Paper 4, homomorphic encryption has high complexity and the number of supported operations is very limited, so it cannot support scenario with large sample sets. The second part is algorithm. Here, data distribution is divided into horizontal distribution and vertical distribution. Horizontal distribution through horizontal division of data. Each entity can collect the same information characteristic for different data objects. Many practical problems belong to this data model. For example, different banks collect data for their customers. The collective functions are the same for all banks. Vertical distribution is when dividing data vertically. Each entity collects different information about the same entity set. For example, banks, health insurance companies, and auto insurance companies collect different information about the same person. The bank has customer information, such as average monthly deposit, account balance, etc. Health insurance companies can assess medical information and other policy information. Car insurance companies can assess information, such as car types, accident claims, etc. They can jointly assess whether the person has credit risk of life insurance. In the scheme of horizontal data distribution, and participants have their own data set, which have the same features. In the training phase, the end participants solve the local self optimization problem respectively, and the ADMM algorithm is used to solve the global classifier with the interactive intermediate state. According to the specific situation of algorithm, this paper proposes a scheme sharing and additive secret sharing. In order to solve the convex optimization problem defined by the support vector machine for horizontal distribution of data and reconstruct the problem, an ADMM algorithm based on the variable penalty coefficient matrix is introduced to facilitate the subsequent iterative solution process of the basic ADMA algorithm in the design frame of the privacy protection scheme. Here, the iterative solution set are simplified, and the iterative process is simplified according to the augmented Lagrange function. It can be seen from the orange part that the i participant need to collect v subscript j superscript t to solve equation to obtain 
v subscript i superscript t plus 1 and need to update v subscript j superscript t plus 1 after neighbor update lambda subscript i plus superscript t plus 1. However, considering the purpose of privacy protection, other participants may not directly disclose their intermediate states. Here is the pre computing privacy protection scheme. The participants interact with each other to share the separated data and conduct comparison. To sum up, after the introduction of secret sharing technology, the interaction between nodes increases, but many calculations that require interaction such as row, the calculation of increasing sequence and multiplication triple can be pre-calculated, independent of the iterative, iterative process and will not increase the computational cost of the training process. In the scheme of vertical distribution of data, the system model diagram indicates that there are n participants, and m indicates the total number of training set sample for each participant. In the scenario of vertical data distribution, data is divided by characteristic. According to the specific situation of algorithm, this paper proposes a scheme to safely solve the global classifi classifier by combining ADM algorithm and Shamir secret sharing. In order to solve the distributed SVN model of vertical distribution of data in a fully distributed way, the sharing form of ADM algorithm is introduced. This form can split bone examples and features and is suitable for solving the machine learning model of vertical distribution of data. The optimization problem is now reconstructed and the solution based on ADMM can be derived more easily in the future. Convert the constraint conditions into the formula and introduce a new variable Z to construct the optimization problem. Note that when the variable Z is updated, because Z subscript J equals B subscript J multiple V subscript J, there is a total of M sub multiple M variables, which generate huge computational overhead. In the sub subsequent FSVMS scheme, there will be a method used to simplify the process of updating variable Z. Here is the algorithm of computing BV safely for FSVMS. Without disclosing the intermediate state V subscript J and the original sample set V subscript J, all participants collaborate to calculate B multiple V. The detailed scheme is shown in the algorithm above. The third part is evaluation. Before demonstrating experimental results, we first offer the setting of experiment. The following experiments are carried on the desktop, running the 64-bit Ubuntu 18.04.1 operating system with Intel Core i7 CPU and 64 GB memory. The secret sharing scheme is implemented by CPP. By this setting, the time efficiency is evaluated. As for the efficient effectiveness, the FSVM is implemented on the MNIST. Since secret sharing is introduced to achieve privacy preserving goals, there is a great concern on the time efficiency. When combining secret sharing with ADM iterations, Table 1% experimental result when D varies from 100 to 1000 with a step size of 100. In addition, the running time for the method in paper 11 is evaluating for comparison with FSVNC when data partitioning by examples. It can be seen that the execution time increases linearly with the sequence length. The implementation of Boolean circuit uses more gate and takes a long time. However, the sequence generation process is independent of the training process and can be calculated in advance to reduce the computational cost of the actual training process. With respect to the running time for the online phase in FSVNC, 
the method in paper 11, and as experience as it linearly increases with d increases. Specifically, in the case of data partitioning by examples, benefiting from the offline phase, the running time for SVNC is about 1,350 times lower than that of the method in paper 11. This significant improvement is due to the heavy computation overhead introduced by additional homomorphic encryption in paper 11. As for FSVMS, data are participated by features and the number of features to be considered by the enrolled participant is smaller than that of FSVMC. It is direct that the running time for FSVMC S is smaller than that for FSVMC. As is shown in Figure 2, the prediction accuracy of FSVMC FSVNC is over as the number of iterations increases. It is explicit that all the PA converts to around 0.95 when the value of the n value but the speed for converge are different. This is because as n increases larger, the number of data increase held by each participant becomes smaller and less data entries means that the participant mainly relies on the received intermediate state from others to drive a more generalized classifier. Figure 3 depicts the prediction accuracy PA of SVNS versus the number of iteration where n varies from 2 to 5. The experimental results here are similar to those of FSVNC. Unlike FSVNC, where each participant can obtain partial information of the global data distribution from the locally held data. Any independent participant in FS1CS can only have some of the features to be considered for classification, and the relationships among these features might not be obvious. As a result, less information about the global data distribution will be derived from FS1CS is implemented. Where data are participant partitioned by feature by features. Hence PA of FSVNS have a slower convergence speed here than that of FSVNC. And even for the best case when n equals two, PA converges after more than one hundred iterations. The fourth part is conclusion. In this paper, we propose a privacy preserving scheme for distributed support vector machines, which construct as well as classifiers in a distributed and privacy preserving manner. The main idea is to combine DNA algorithm and secret sharing technology and use the decomposability of a DNA algorithm and the nature of secret sharing security computing to achieve the goal of cooperating training and privacy protection in fully distributed scenes. Because there are two cases of data in distributed scenarios, data is partitioned through examples and features. Our FSVM privacy protection scheme consists of FSVNC and FSVNS, and we propose privacy protection schemes to deal with these two cases respectively. And that's all. Thank you. Um, that will be our first paper uh, by Director of Support, uh, Lots of Machine Learning for Smart Cities. Um, since the authors will not be able to join us today, um, if we have any questions, um, please feel free to send us send it to our organizing committee, and we will definitely forward your question to the authors, or you can. Um, wait until the paper has been published, uh, has been released online, then you will be able to contact the author directly too. Um, thank you for your time. And uh, we will now proceed to the second paper um, in the morning session. Uh, the title for the paper is MEC Application Migration by Using Advanced Edge. Um, the author is um, uh, Braj Wadika. Um, 
um, Gianfranco Anacioni from University of Stavanger um, in Norway, and uh, also um, we have the author Rosario Agaropo from University of Pisa from Italy. Um, I can see our first author Prachi is in the chat. Um, would you prefer me to uh, play your pre-recorded video for the slides, and you can do the QA session? or you prefer to do a conduct a live presentation um, by sharing your screen at here. Um, Prachi, can you hear me? Uh, hi, uh, you can play the recorded version. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Prachi. I will then play the pre-recorded uh, um, slide and uh, later on when we have a question, we can ask our author directly in the Q&A session. Yes, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, here we come. It is the second paper of the morning session, MEC application migration by using an advantage. Thank you. Hello and greetings to everyone. My name is Prachi Vadakkar. I'm a doctoral research fellow at the Department of Electrical and Computer Science Engineering at the University of Stavanger, Norway. I will be presenting the paper entitled as MEC application migration by using advantage. This work has been supported by the Norwegian Research Council through the 5G Modernai project. This will be the outline of the presentation where I will provide a brief introduction to the MEC technology and its tools. Then I will present the paper contribution towards MEC. Following that, I will describe the emulated network scenario, the experimentation and the experimental results. Finally, I will conclude this presentation. So what is MEC? MEC, multi-axis edge computing technology defined by the HC standardized body. MEC enables the cloud computing capabilities and an IP service environment at the edge of the cellular network and more in general at the edge of the network. Whereas MEC ecosystem proposes emulation tools and solutions for testing MEC models and applications in which Advantage is one of them. Advantage is a mobile edge emulation platform tool where it allows to rapidly test MEC services and resource management techniques within the 5G MEC infrastructure. Many virtualization technologies such as Kubernetes and Docker support the edge computing. Kubernetes is an open source framework for extending native containerized application orchestration capabilities to the MEC host at the edge of the network. ME Kubernetes supports the deployment and the management of the MEC applications as well as the MEC hosts. Whereas Docker helps to run the MEC applications in a containerized form. This work focuses on the concept of the MEC application migration. So why MEC application migration is needed? Due to the user mobility within the network. The user movement within the network leads to the network entity or the point of access change that can happen. The new point of access can be associated to a different MEC host from a serving MEC host. That leads to the relocation of the MEC application to the new MEC host or the closest MEC host to the user. The MEC application migration supports the transfer of the user specific application state. Whereas for serving the user application, the targeted MEC host needs to have the application running. Thus, my MEC application migration ensures the user application connectivity to the MEC host for better quality of experience. 
In this paper, as mentioned earlier, advantage has been used to test the MEC deployment scenario. The paper contribution focuses on the new mechanism for the MEC application migration. The new mechanism focused on the strategies within the Kubernetes. As the standard Kubernetes does not have the ability to perform the migration. While the recent re research work proposes the new mechanism that is referred as the extended Kubernetes. Although there has been no work on the integration with the advantage. To integrate the solution with advantage an element is introduced. The element is referred as manager. Also can be treated as an orchestrator of the system. Finally, the paper describes the experimental test to demonstrate the performance of the MEC application migration. Emulated network scenario. The emulated network scenario is created using Advantage graphical user interface. The UE1 presented in the green box is connected to the zone 1, whereas zone 2 and zone 3 includes MEC host referred as H1 and H2. Along with this, each zone has three different network access technologies such as Wi-Fi, 5G and 4G. Whereas the UE application that is the VLC1 application connects to the MEC host applications that is the Mac app via the point of access depending on the user equipment movement. The experimental work is divided over three phases. The first phase explains the deployment and the working structure. Here is the overview of the testbed presenting the logical connectivity of the involved elements. Nook 1 runs the advantage platform, whereas Nook 2 and Nook 3 are the H1 and H2 MEC host. Advantage supports the external node and the application integration. Advantage platform graphical user interface is accessed using the IP address and the emulated network scenario is created and deployed. Whereas the H1 and H2 are mapped within the emulated network scenario using the IP addresses and the port number. The Nuke 1 runs the UE applications which is the VLC app. Initially, the UE is connected to the H1 MEC host where the MEC app VLC server is running and video streaming application that is deployed in a container and is managed by the Kubernetes pod. Along with this, Kubernetes manages the MEC host that is the H1 and H2. Whereas the H1 MEC host also has the entity called as the pod migration controller where the pod migration controller watches and controls the migration. This is the third phase of the experimentation. The second phase is involved and described in the paper. For the time constraint, I will be presenting the third phase. The MEEP control engine is part of the advantage platform where the scenario is deployed. The Mac app H1 is the MEC host H1 application, whereas the Mac app H2 is the H2 MEC application. The manager is the entity that is deployed and involved with the H1 MEC host and that controls the migration between the two MEC hosts. Along with this, there is an entity which is the pod migration controller. Initially, the emulated network scenario is created and deployed using the MIP control engine. The manager registers the information regarding the scenario where it registers the information of the location of point of access and the user equipments via the APIs. Initially, UE is closest to the Mac app H1 node. The UE connects to the manager group as well as UE establishes the connection and the data routing with the Mac app H1. Along with this, during the user movement, the point of user movement 
uh, is created when the manager creates a point of access mobility event within the scenario the point of access change has been happened now the ue is cl closest to the h2 mec host this information is registered with the manager as soon as the ue is closer to the h2 manager starts the migration from h1 mec host to h2 mec host using pod migration controller the pod migration controller after starting the migration starts checking the information regarding the source pod whether the source pod is running or not once mac app h1 refers to the source pod running information with the pod migration controller the pod migration controller creates a checkpoint for the source pod along with this checkpoint path is created between the mac app h2 once the checkpoint info is created at h2 mec host the pod is restored as soon as the pod is restored the pod migration controller affirms the connection of the new pod is running or not once the new pod is running it establishes the connection with the user equipment again after the connection is established with the h2 mec application the source pod is deleted by the manager whereas the downtime is only observed from the checkpoint information creation until the restoration of the pod while the migration time is observed between the checkpoint source pod until the source pod is deleted the experimental result the test aims to determine the pod migration capabilities of the extended kubernetes and the different time related to the performance parameters this figure summarizes the different time related parameters that can be measured during the experimental sessions furthermore the observed values during only one migration are reported in the bottom line the test reports the mec application migration average time value which is 3.762 seconds the start of the delay is noted between the manager to the pod migration operator whereas the start config delay mentioned in the figure relates to the collecting the information about the running pods such as whether the source pod is running or not and the current video state whereas the pod checkpoint delay is provided for establishing the checkpoint path with the destination host while the time accumulated within the checkpoint pod is completed is and the pod is ready to serve while the image download delay and the container creation delay are observed within the pod migration controller as well as the container start delay is observed once the container is started the source pod is deleted and the source pod deletion delay has been observed this complete delay presents the co complete pod setup delay a more deep analysis has been carried out observing a large set of migration events a total number of 100 migrations were taken place between the two mec host that is h1 and h2 as the ue moves in the circular loop the extended kubernetes approaches help to achieve a better and stable mec application migration latency the values recorded with the help of the kubernetes log the time recorded in the logs depicts each state of the pod migration creation until the deletion whether the table this table reports the statistical value of the of the above table parameters during the experimental tests the reported values refers to the statistics estimate observing 100 pod migration executions this figure reports the mean and the 95% confidence interval of the total migration time taken by the pod migration operator where the figure points out the large ci 
when only 10 migrations were observed. In that case, the value lies between 2.7 seconds until 4.5 seconds. On the contrary, after the observation of the 100 migrations, the 95% confidence interval has a size of only 134 milliseconds around the mean value. Finally, I will conclude this presentation. As we have validated the proposed architecture with the open source tools such as the Advantage Emulation Platform tool and the Kubernetes as an orchestrator. For the testbed, we have developed a customized element referred as Manager that allows to perform the MEC application migration. Along this, we have evaluated the deployment and the migration times between two MEC hosts. Thank you so much for your attention. Please email for any inquiries regarding the uh, paper or the presentation. Thank you. Um, thank you, Prakash. Um, we have a question from the chat, which is translated. Um, it was mentioned that did you consider some uh, cyber security issues, in particular, preventing man in the middle type of attacks during your migration process? And the question especially concerns the fact that application in cloud environment or many microservice uh, services, uh, each communication channel between microservices offering hacking opportunity. Um, Perhaps if you want to um, have a little chat with Philip and uh, provide the um, have some discussion. Okay, uh, I can answer the question right now, or I, um, should I just type the answer? Oh, you can just answer the question and the audience, the audience can also have an opportunity to learn. <laughs> to okay. Thank you. Okay. So uh, during the migration process, we did not uh, uh, check any uh, cybersecurity issues related. But although uh, Kubernetes has been very uh, available in the age computing market, and there has been a lot of curiosity regarding this, and I know there, there is a certain work going on, but we did not do anything for the migration process. Thank you. Thank you, Paraji. Philip, um, does that answer your sure part here? That's great. Thank you. And there, uh, um, do we have any other questions for Paraji? Um, I personally have a one very quick question, but it's more about that the future work. Um, it's about the delays that you um, have in, while you're doing the migration. Do you have any, like in the future work, do you have any plans or um, any further studies about like to reduce these kind of the delay during the migration process? Because uh, we know MEC, one nature of things like MEC is um, low latency, so the very fast response, the very low um, delay. Uh, yes, uh, we will have some future work uh, since uh, currently the work uh, only considers the fact that the application will be migrated and the orchestrator is not th that of a mature. Uh, so the orchestrator actually uh, considers the migrating the whole application to the another MEC host, whereas our future work will consider the impact of the having the application already running on the prior to the uh, migration process so that uh, the latency can be reduced. Great, thank you. Thank and, you. Uh, wish you good, uh, best luck in the future work. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so now we will move to the third paper. Um, the title of the paper is Design of a 5G Experience or Platform Based on Open Air Interface. The author for this paper is Philip um, Owazarski um, from LAS CNI. And um, also we have a uh, uh, author, Quentin Duhari. Yeah, hello to you. Um, uh, Mehdi and uh, Pascal Brattle, uh, Daniel's um, Dragon Mirror School, for the same organization, LASDNIS. Yep, thank you. Um, Mehdi is going to, uh, to do the presentation, not a problem. So I will stop my share. And Mehdi, um, and over to you. Uh, hello, uh, it's okay. You can play the pre-recorded video and I'll be here to answer any question if needed. Oh yeah, not a problem.
Thank you. I'll play that. No, thank you. Hello everyone, and let me first thank you for attending this presentation, which is the achievement of our master's thesis project. It was led by myself, Elmedi Djeloul and Quentin Douar, under the guidance of Philippe Ovezarski, Pascal Bertou, and Daniela Dragomirescu. The project took place in the System Architecture and Analysis Laboratory, laboratory from the French National Scientific Research Centre, we would first like to thank them for giving us the opportunity to work on this very motivating project where we designed a 5G experimental platform based on an open source code called OpenAir Interface. So during this presentation, we will review the main steps which led us to building this platform. And first we will start with defining what 5G is and what kind of services it is aimed at providing. The second step will consist in presenting the OpenAir interface software, which was used to build the 5G experimental platform. Then we will see how we designed and built this very platform. Eventually, we will end with the evaluation of the performance we were able to achieve with this setup. So, First things first, what is 5G? Here we present the, uh, the standalone 5G architecture, which consists of mainly three parts. The one you must know very well, which is the user equipment, which can take many forms, such as the usual smart smartphone or smart house devices. It can even be IoT objects, and these user equipments communicate with different GNOTBs which are basically geographically spread antennas and which constitute the radio access network, also known as the RAN. This architecture is governed and orchestrated by the 5G core network, which aims at providing the right services at the right time for the right user equipment. If 5G was born, it was for an obvious reason which can be decomposed into two main goals. First, increase the throughput anyway, and then the second, decrease latency whichever the provided service may be. As far as those services are concerned, they can be categorized in three different main families. The first one being the EMM, EMBB, which stands for Enhanced Mobile Broadband, and which concerns user equipments such as a smartphones and computers. Its goal is to mainly provide a larger bandwidth in order to get more throughput. The second family, called URLLC, which stands for Ultra Reliable Low Latency Communications, concerns services which need a very low latency. It could be a distant surgery, or it could be any operation related to Industry 4.0. Last but not least, MMTC, which stands for Massive Machine Type Communications, concerns the Internet of the Objects, which require easy access to the network without necessarily having to have a huge throughput or a very low latency. In order to build such a network and to provide such services, I mean such differentiated services, the 5G architecture is mainly softwareized and this allows for a very high flexibility and at the same time a very low operational cost. During this project, the main goal was to be able to build a 5G experimental platform, so we took all the bet on the software-defined network possibilities in order to get the most flexible and the cheapest platform possible. In order to do so, we used an open source code which is called OpenAir Interface and which was designed and developed by Uricom, which is a French engineering school. Our choice was OpenAir Interface because of its 
accurate and realistic development. As a matter of fact, OpenAir interface complies with every 3GPP standard, especially 15 and 16. Moreover, it is based on a real-time Linux architecture, which allows to get a really uh, good realistic emulation of the 5G network. This open source code includes all the main components for the 5G architecture, which is the user equipment, GNOBBs, and also the core network, even though they are developed separately. It is also a software-defined radio-oriented code, so it is USRP compatible, and that approach allows us to, re to use real signals and real radio frequencies in order to build the 5G platform. So here you can have a general view of our platform, which you can see is very basic, but contains everything you need to build a 5G network. As far as the core network and the GNOBB are concerned, they are installed and configured on an 18 core server using a USRP X310 and as far as the user equipment is concerned, it required in the first time another 18 core server aligned with the USRP X310. Let us now take a closer look to the different components of the 5G experimental platform. First, we use log periodic antennas in order to transmit the signal from the user equipment to the GNOB plus core network or vice versa. The advantage of the log periodic antennas is that they have a wide functioning band. In our case, it would go from 850 MHz to 6.5 GHz. And another main advantage of these antennas is that even though they have a directional radiation pattern, it can still cover a wide enough area. In our case, it was 120 degrees. Here you can see that we split the user equipment and the couple GNOB plus core network into two different servers, which are exactly the same as far as hardware is concerned. That is to say 18 core Dell 7920 and we installed on each of these servers Linux Ubuntu 20.04 uh, with a low latency kernel. The low latency kernel was very important because in order to deal with realistic signals and to treat real-time signals as efficiently as possible, you need to have very low latency and a kernel which can perform real-time computations just like what would be done in a real communication between a GNOB and the user equipment. As I have told you before, the whole open source code is the exit software emulating every network component on the servers. To make this code manageable by the wireless network, the use of USRP was crucial. We used them to transmit information between GNOBBs and user equipments or the other way around. This device can treat radio signals with software-defined capabilities. To be more specific, we use the USRP X310 from ETHIS. The main advantage of it is being able to treat 10 gigabytes per second signals via an Ethernet connection and the adjunction of a, of a SFP Plus module to support such a throughput. So, once everything was installed, the launching of the network required some configuration especially as far as the frequency band is concerned, and also everything related to treating real-time signals. Once we were able to make communicate the user equipment installed on the server with the GNOB plus core network, we decided to test our platform on a commercial user equipment. And so for the very first time, it was performed using a Google Pixel 6. To be able to program this commercial user equipment with our very own information of the network, we had to use a programmable SIM card, which was provided by OpenCells, a French startup. 
Now that all the hardware we use has been presented, let us see what was built on these servers. For example, here you can see the 5G core network architecture. In this architecture, everything in blue was implemented in the Opener interface project, but still required some configurations. The AMF, which stands for Authentication Management Field, is the entry point from the RAN to the core network and represents the most crucial part of the good configuration of the experimental platform. The whole architecture was based on Docker and each part of the core network is installed on a container, providing network independency of the different parts, just like it would be in real life. In order to follow all the exchanges between the user equipment, the RAN and the core network, we used Wireshark and looked after the NGAP protocol messages. These messages ensure that the res registration of the user equipment to the network is correct and thus make the user equipment access the whole 5G network. Once we were able to connect the user equipment to the network and once the connection was stabilized, we decided to evaluate the performance of the platform. Needless to say that noisy conditions and the huge computational cost of the operations did not provide the best environment to perform such tests. And as you can see, our first experiments did not show performance expected from a 5G connection. The state this test was made with Hyper 3 on a uh, 0.1 megabit data and a 0.1 megahertz bandwidth in the 2.5 gigahertz functioning frequency, which was the first configuration where the theoretical throughput was reached. This second example also shows that the theoretical throughput was reached on the N78, aka 3.5 GHz, which is a band used by mobile network operators in Europe, for example. After that, we made five transfers, and here you can see the results for 100 MB on bands N41 and N78. The average throughputs and latencies were obtained using Wireshark, the monitoring of the latency was not directly possible, but we simplified it, considering it as half the round trip time. Of course, the results were expected. When the frequency increases, the throughput increases as well, while the latency is reduced. But as you can see, our platform was not able to reach the 3GPP standards, which require a 10 gigabytes per, per second throughput, and for the EMM, EMBB slice, and less than uh, one millisecond latency. The environment, environment noise, the huge computational cost, and the lack of more powerful hardware accounts for such discrepancies. In order to make things more tangible, we connected our commercial user equipment to the experimental platform and we performed various usual operations, which all were successful. The 5G network generated by our platform helped us send and receive emails, access the web, and also perform audio and video streamings. In order to sum up all the work done during this project, we can say that we went through different phases. First, designing the 5G experimental platform took us time in order to choose the right equipment and most importantly, the right open source code to exploit. Building it also affords us to handle diverse equipments such as USRPs, which functioning, which functioning requires knowledge in digital communications. Deploying it comes intimately with debugging since the adaptation of the code to our hardware was a non-stop bugging situation. Eventually, once everything was ready to work, we were able to perform some tests and certify that making a 5G network that is as powerful as the standards require is a much more difficult task. 
Of course, this platform is a very good start, but in order to reach the right performance, there is still a long way to go. Nevertheless, we learned a lot about vir virtualization and softwareization of this cellular network. This proved to provide a very flexible network at minimum cost. This base will also help us deploy new services with the goal to achieve the best performances. The main motivation behind this work was to implement slicing capabilities of the 5G network, but unfortunately this option is not available yet. Once the source code is delivered by OpenAir interface, we aim at testing optimization algorithms. These algorithms may concern resource allocation to differentiated services, as well as the optimization of the power consumption during the data transfer. Thank you very much for your attention. We were very honored to present this work to you. And now, if you have any question, feel free to ask them. Thank you. Um, thanks, Mahadi. Um, for our audience, do we have any questions for Mahadi? No. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I have a um, quick question um, regard to the. Um, uh, it is first of all, it's very, uh, it's very uh, comprehensive uh, preliminary experiment platforms for five G by using the OAI. Um, on there's a one question which is on slide nine. If I if I need to move that back to that slide, and it was mentioned about universal software uh, radio behavior. Um, would you mind like it to have a like a, for these devices that here is that like a software defined um, um, devices or is um, would you please like have a further extent on um, this page at here, maybe? I'm sorry, I did not really understand the question. Can you please repeat it? Yeah, okay. could you like it please further extend on this page? Um, just want to know a um, little bit more about these USRP uh, X310 um, devices. What's the capabilities for that devices? Um... Oh, okay, okay. Uh, so, as um, as it was explained during the presentation, the use of USRPs was uh, uh, inevitable, and uh, <clears throat> at first we started with the basic USRPs uh, B to tens. And uh, it turned out that their performance were not enough. They they would run on uh, USB 3.0, which would um, uh, limit us to uh, a throughput of uh, five gigabits per second. And uh, very quickly, we uh, decided to change the USRP because we understood that um, a major part of the 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 possibility to um, improve the the transfer of the signal between uh, the user equipment and the GNB was uh, made by the process done by the USRP. So um, we uh, took a step up and uh, cho uh, chose a USRP X310. Does it answer your question? Yes, uh, that's great. Thanks. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, yeah, because at the end of the slide, you was mentioned about optimization. So, because um, uh, in OAI um, scenarios, we also have a, also another solution, which is software defined um, devices. We can use the software defined 5G systems, uh, which is including for the network function virtualization, cloud, which is CBAN, or just the SDN um, using integrated together with mobile edge computing. Um, but in our experiment, because um, it's a very straightforward experiment. Did you consider the um, signal interferences during your experiment? Or what about a performance? Did you consider that part before? Or what, like, did you actually do any experiment on the signal interferences? Well, um, it was obvious that uh, the environment we worked in was, uh, uh, an, I would say, an opportunity for interference to be created and to be generated and to be interfering in the process. But um, at the first glance, it was not our main objective to take into account such interference. 
because uh, the first goal we really wanted to achieve is basically just to be able to transfer uh, packets from the user equipment to the GNRB. Now, uh, future works will definitely include the uh, consideration of the uh, interference uh, as part of the improvement of the performance of this uh, platform. So this very work was, uh, let us say, very basic because uh, the, the main result of it uh, was just to see the network uh, function properly. Now that is that uh, this step is uh, is over, we can uh, achieve. We can try to achieve better performance, and uh, of course, take into account any interference and uh, study how they would uh, impact the data transfer. No, okay, no problem. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, do we have any um, other questions for um, Bolton? <laughs> no, okay, cool. Uh, we'll move to the next uh, paper. So for everyone else, if you are not prepared to, uh, to ask the question at this moment, but please feel free to um, contact the authors or contact our organizing committee to forward your questions in the future. You're more than welcome. You're more than welcome to do that. So thank you so much. So we'll move to the next paper. Um, the title for the paper is An Efficient Data Retrieval Method for Blockchain. The author for this paper is uh, Ya Fong Li, uh, Han Huang, and uh, Li Chuan Ma from Chile University. Um, again, these authors, uh, they are not able to participate today. Um, we will play the pre recorded the video, and if we have questions, uh, we will send through uh, via the emails. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Today, I will talk about the paper of an efficient data retrieval method for blockchain. Now, let's begin. I will introduce the paper in three parts, which are the background of data retrieval on blockchain, the detail of the efficient data retrieval method for blockchain, and the experiment of our method. OK, let's look at the first part the background of data retrieval on blockchain. In recent years, the technology of blockchain has become more and more mature. The idea of decentralization has become more and more recognized, and the various new and widely known scanners have emerged, such as non-fugible tokens, metaverse, and so on. Look at the red picture. It's a small piece of code of NFT. It can be seen that in the future, blockchain will not only be a carrier of decentralized cryptocurrency, but also a carrier of more and more applications. The blockchain will carry more and more value in the future. And accordingly, it will need to store more and more data to support its value. Then, let's focus on the storage for blockchain. Most existing blockchains use key-value non-relational database at the bottom of the system to improve write data performance by reducing read data performance. However, as the date in the blockchain increase, the demand for on-chain data retrieval increase. And the advantage of fast data writing of key value non relational database can't be reflected. Despite the increasing maturity of blockchain technology, most solutions nowadays are for small data as well as large data on the chain. It goes without saying that there are major solutions for small data with existing chains such as Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Fabric. There are also many solutions for large data, usually at least in GPUs. Here gives two examples. Xu and Zhang proposed a scheme for enabling verifiable billing range query over blockchain database. 
Pei and Zhu proposed a scheme for an efficient query scheme for hybrid storage blockchain based on Mocker Semtic Tree. However, these schemes have some disadvantages as follows. First and foremost, they can't be able to store large and more complex data. Secondly, only store tamper-proof hash credentials for files on chain. Last but not least, these schemes can't retrieve files through the blockchain. In order to give the blockchain richer functionality, we need to upload more information into the blockchain. Because of the simple structure of the transactions in the current block, appending data to the blockchain is currently done in the form of four updates, which leaves a considerable amount of data to be stored repeatedly and can consume a lot of precious storage resources on the chain. For simple structured data, this is as it should be and as it must be, but extending to complex data, it's less desirable to append its last data directly in the form of full volume updates, which when too large can make the blockchain take up a considerable amount of physics space and seriously degrade system performance. Our contributions are as follows. This paper focuses on the inability of the existing blockchain to upload more complex data and the slow retrieval rate, which can lead to the inability of the blockchain to be applied to more scanners. We propose a new structure for storing complex data in blockchain in order to reduce the redundancy of data storage on the chain in the distributed storage blockchain scanner. Design a counted Bloom filter jump table structure via Bloom filter and jump table structures in order to improve target retrieval efficiency and enrich semantic query in a low speed occupation scanner. And implement the designed retrieval scan in a distributed storage based scanner to complete the design of a decentralized blockchain on chain retrieval system based on distributed storage. Then let's look at the second part the detail of the efficient data retrieval method for blockchain. Our overall structures are as follows. The whole retrieval scheme is divided into two parts, the counting bloom filter jumping table and the intra-block retrieval optimization. The counting bloom filter jumping table is mainly designed to greatly improve the retrieval performance of the blockchain for complex data without taking up a large amount of storage space. The intra-block optimization changes the transaction structure to make it more suitable for storing complex data and speed up intra-block data retrieval. In order to implement an efficient retrieval scheme for blockchain based on complex data, a candid bloom filter jump table structure is designed in this series. The first point is that using a bloom filter structure in each block can effectively improve the efficiency of querying in the blockchain. The second point is that the counting bloom filter structure used in this construction, which is an advanced version of the bloom filter, allows the bloom filter to be used in more scanners, severe precise detection results are required. We provide the following method for the counting bloom filter we have designed. Add method, the method of adding data to a bloom filter. In our scheme, a more efficient pursuit of random algorithm is used. Add bloom and sub bloom methods. These are both methods are process the current bloom filter value. Add or subtract the current bloom filter value from other bloom filter values and resend the result to the current bloom filter value. Test method. This method is used to check whether data exists in the current bloom filter value. 
the return value is billing. A brief description of the algorithm for the creation of counted bloom filter values in new blocks is given in the picture. Moreover, look at the picture we give an algorithm for acquiring data from a blockchain with a counting bloom filter. Then, we do some search performance optimization. In order to be able to enrich the retrieval semantics as well as to speed up the retrieval, the structure of the transaction is redesigned in this thesis to make it more suitable for non-transactional scanners. The final block body structure is in the tables as follows. Our optimization schemes are as follows. Find the lasted label number and use a point topology sorting in the direct acylink graph to get all the results quickly. And design a unique Mocker deck structure based on the above deck in order to facilitate user verification of the correctness of the query results. Then, let's look at the last part, the experiment of our method. Our experiment's environmental is shown in the table. The operating system is Ubuntu 16. The CPU is Intel Core 7th generation of i7. The memory of computer is 16 GB. The experiment platform is GS 1.8. The programming language is Golang. First, let's look at the search performance results. The left picture shows the effect of search performance with distance. It illustrates the increase in query latency as the distance to the last block increase. It can be seen that the traditional SROM retrieval scheme has the lowest latency when the distance is small. Traditional SROM does not build complex retrieval index. So, for such, Query it requires a learner scan from the last version. Therefore, when the requested version is very new, it will be faster because the number of reads is small. However, as the distance increases, its performance degraded rapidly. The right picture shows the impact of retrieval performance with the increasing number of blocks. In our scheme, the performance of our scheme outperforms that of MST in figure because the counted bloom filter hoping table reduces the total amount of data that needs to be read. Another phenomenon in figure is the large fluctuation in the number of MST delays. The specific reason for the fluctuation can be attributed to MST's Mocker Pantry Share Tree Index. The requested version may be located at different levels of the tree as the total number of blocks increase. Second, let's look at the multi data label query performance. The left picture shows the impact of multi-tag searching on search performance. It shows the effect of single tag retrieval as well as full tag retrieval on retrieval performance. And we can see that the overall retrieval performance of our scheme is better than that of the MST scheme. Also, Comparing the effect of different number of tags on retrieval performance for the same scheme. It can be seen from the figure that the retrieval performance for multi tag retrieval is equivalent to that of single tag indexing due to the Mocker Patricia train indexing of MST. Our solution. On the other hand, it's optimized for 
multi-label travel. With the higher the number of labels, the shorter the respond time for retrieval. The right picture shows the actual disk footprint of each solution. Our solution outperforms the MST solution as well as the traditional SROOM smart contract solution. The reason for this is that our solution only adds a Bloom filter verifiable to each block header and also makes certain optimizations to the storage of complex data in the block body, enabling incremental data update operations, further reducing the data disk frame put of the blockchain. The Mocker Patricia tree index built in the MST. On the other hand, increase dramatically as the data increases. The traditional SROOM smart contract solution does not conform the data structure of the composite data store. So when the data is updated, it needs to be updated in full and can't be updated increasingly as in this paper. That's all of my presentation. Thanks for listening to my speech. Um, thanks for also to share um, the presentation with us. And um, again, um, if we have any question, uh, please feel free to let us know and we will forward your question to the author. Um, yeah, actually, I think I have some um, kinds of practices with Ethereum blockchain as work well on public chains. So I have noticed that all of your work um, is performed onto the private environments and possibly I'm guessing um, your blockchain established is based on the private environment, is that right? Um, because the author is not um, in the room today. <laughs> uh, uh -huh. I will not, yeah, I'll record down your questions and forward the questions to the author. Uh -huh. and, uh, yeah, um, right. we'll get answers from them. Yeah. yeah, yeah, sure. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Um, great. So, um, sorry for the slight delay, and uh, we will now move on to the last paper of the in the morning session. The paper name is POET Self Learning Framework for Proficient Industrial Operations Behavior. The authors for this paper is um, uh, Ankush Mashram and uh, Yogan Bayer from uh, Kashuha Institute of Technology, uh, and Marcus Karch, um, Christian Ha from the Fahova Institute of um, Optronics, System Technologies, and Image Exploration. Um, I can see Ankush, um, our first author, Ankush Mashram, is in the room. Um, hi. Ankush? Yeah. yeah, hi Ankush. Yeah, because um, we didn't, um, uh, maybe not enough time to receive your um, pre-recorded video, so uh, would you like to share your presentation um, online? I think the recording should be with you, so so I got um, an email that. Yeah, we yeah, at the at the back. Um, we let me quickly double confirm. Yeah, um, we didn't, um, from, uh, from, from the EAI uh, community, we didn't um, successfully process the, the video recording. Um, do you have okay. your slides that they can share um, now? Or... 
Okay, so maybe then I will uh, play my own recording so that I think it's easy. Oh, yeah, that's not a problem. Okay, yeah, so. Yeah, so you can share your screen. Yeah, let me just, yeah. Also, then I will have to check the. Um, no, uh, so. So, uh, sorry, uh, was the video, uh, was the audio of the video, uh, could you hear it? Uh, we can't see your shared screen yet. Oh, okay. Uh, sorry, just give me a minute. Take your time. Uh, is it visible now? Yes, yeah, visible. The slide is visible now. Okay, so I will play and just let me know if you hear the sound. Sure. Um, we'll not be able to hear the sound. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. So it should be in now. Hi, I'm Ankush Mashram, presenting yeah, our paper "Poet: A Self Learning Framework." Okay, so then I'll just play the slides. And yeah. here for the questions. Thank you. For profanate industrial operations behavior. It's a joint work between Castle Security Labs and Fraunhofer IOSP Karlsruhe. Poet is a tool being developed under the Adin suit, a collection of methods for anomaly detection in industrial networks. Industrial control systems are controlling and executing different industrial processes such as manufacturing of automobiles, medicines, and even in critical infrastructures. With fourth industrial revolution, the separation between office networks and process network is blurred. An user in corporate office can access a controller on the shop floor to change the process parameters. This has led to multiple cyber incidents in industrial systems in the last decade, beginning with Stuxnet in 2010, Till the recent Triton incident. There are different cyber solutions to detect such incidents, particularly network based intrusion detection systems, NIDS, monitor network traffic to detect the cyber threats. Moreover, NIDS for ICS can be grouped in three categories protocol analysis based, traffic mining based, and control process analysis based. In reality, most of the industrial systems are brownfield installations. They are commissioned for longer durations, amounting to decades, which makes them non-compliant to advancements in security mechanisms. Upgrading is an expensive process for plant owners. Also, the network infrastructure information becomes unavailable. Either it is lost or the responsible personnel has left the company. Under these circumstances, designing or configuring ICS and IDS is challenging because the underlying process or process parameters being exchanged is not known and active network information querying is prohibited as it might hinder the time critical process raising safety concerns. So the overall goal is to develop self-learning anomaly detection frameworks for industrial networks to detect attacks targeting the normal industrial operations under unavailable infrastructure information. Moreover, Germany's Federal Office for Information Security, the BSE, outlined the categories of requirements for features of anomaly detection solutions in industrial networks. Amongst them, the relevant categories for our work are, first, the general requirement to list communicating devices, protocols, and the communication base in the network, a second category requires to detect the causes of unusual activities in the industrial network or networking events disrupting the industrial operations. In the view of the BSA requirements, there are two research problems defined for our work. First, how to make an industrial systems network transparent for downstream analysis from network traffic, and two, how to enumerate industrial operations from traffic and track them for deviations. Due to the lack of real systems datasets in the literature for development and validation of solutions, 
a miniaturized real world system named Fresh Demonstrator, available at Fraunhofer IOSP, is used. It is Profinet based because the Profinet has the highest market share in Europe for industrial Ethernet systems. The Fresh Demonstrator mimics a painting process that is realized and controlled by real hardware components. And the demonstrator also provides the infrastructure to execute network attacks on the system. There are some works in the literature that models industrial network protocols, message exchanges, and detects the deviation as anomaly. However, they do not consider the effect of the protocol exchange on the industrial operation. For example, a valid protocol exchange could negatively impact the industrial operation. As solution to previously outlined research problems, we have developed a Python-based framework called Profinet Operations Enumeration and Tracking, in short, POET framework, that dissects Ethernet frames to extract network infrastructure information such as asset inventory and logical network topology. While extracting information, POET tracks the operation of an industrial system from startup phase to data exchange phase. In particular, finite state machines are modeled to represent the protocol-based industrial operations at different granularities of overall system, master-slave connection, and industrial components. Within finite state machines, the different states of industrial operations are the states, and the transitions represent the network events observed in the traffic triggering the operations. Poet successfully detected an attack on the demonstrator where the attacker changed the device's logical name through valid protocol exchange. Poet detected the raised invalid operation caused by the attacker's action. Within Profinet system, there is an order of observation operations executed via different protocols as outlined here. We begin with dissecting the protocol frames to enumerate different stages of industrial operations and extract infrastructure information such as asset inventory. For example, the LLDP frames trigger asset discovery and neighborhood detection industrial operation. And through their dissection, the name, a MAC address, and the switch port information uh, is extracted for industrial devices. Here, for example, the component motor lift. Through dissecting ARC packets and PNDCP frames that triggers the address resolution operation, the IP address is extracted for the device. The communication handshake between the controller and the device through different PNCM protocol frames triggers the connection establishment operation. The process parameters are particularly set in this operation and the position of the information in the payload are extracted. PNNO protocol is used for process data exchange. The position of the process parameters in the process payload extracted from the connection establishment is utilized to collect process payload bytes in input and output communication directions, where the communication from device to controller is input communication and the output communication is the communication from controller to the device. The transition between industrial operations triggered by network events are modeled at different granularities as finite state machines. Here, the finite state machine for Profinet device models the industrial operations as states and the triggering events as transitions. The different industrial operations triggered by different network events are mapped following the protocol specification and empirical knowledge gained from industrial setups. Here is the finite state machine for Profinet connection, modeling the different states of a master-slave connection. And at last, this is the finite state machine for the overall Profinet system, modeling its operational states and valid transitions between them. Poet is evaluated for anomaly detection task and for this an attack named rename attack is executed on the demonstrator 
It targets the industrial operations through changing the name of turntable motor to another name via a valid PNDCP protocol exchange. It makes the device unrecognizable to other devices for communication, thus harming the process. The attack was successfully detected as it triggered the invalid operation in the finite state machine for device uh, turntable motor as shown here. Particularly, after being in the data exchange operation, the attacker's action triggered the transition to name resolution operation, which is an invalid transition. To conclude, we presented a OID framework uh, as the first of its kind protocol analysis based ICS and IDS for Profinet. Its passive monitoring and industrial operations tracking functionality satisfies BSA's requirements for anomaly detection in industrial network solutions. As the outlook, similar workflows could be translated to other industrial systems such as with Ethernet IP protocols. The states and triggering events would have to be adapted for finer state machines at different granularities. If you have any questions or suggestions, please contact me or my colleague Marcus Kash. Thank you, Ankush. Um, yeah. A very um, detailed presentation. It's very um, attractive. Um, do we have any questions for Ankush? No. All right, um, Ankush, I've got a, a quick question in regards to the FSM. Yeah. Um, because yeah, we, we know like there's a lot of advantages for the FSM. Like yeah, uh, they're very flexible, easy to move, uh, to to look at like a uh, to code executions and things. But also there's a uh, some advantage, a disadvantage for the FSM as well. Uh, for example, it's not that applicable for all domains, and the order for the state conversions are inflexible. So um, like uh, do you have any um, discussions about these two? uh so so we didn't explore much uh, in that aspect uh, the motivation for such pro uh, protocol exchange communication was the uh, well known tcp ip uh, um ssm model and uh, and we saw that it it has been widely used so we directly uh, started using fsms and then explore the other other models yeah uh, would would you have any suggestions? What what could be explored? Um, like a um example for the like I mean, um, for the FSM, the most critical point is we should consider about state transitions. Yeah. Um, so the best way basically is to uh, visualize the FSM and to think of it um, as a direct graph of the states. So it will be um, more easier for you to to follow up that way. Um, yeah. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Does anyone else have any questions for Enkush? Um, Enkush, do you want to um, move your slides to the um, contact page so it will be uh, easier for us to remember your email addresses and things? Then we'll um, are there. Um, yeah, the audience maybe have questions and they can send you the emails and then your colleagues as well, or even for future collaborations and then we can contact you. Yeah, please do. Thank you so much. No, thank you. Thanks, Krish. Um, thanks for sharing your presentation. You're welcome. Um, yeah, um, so that would be the last paper of the morning session. Um, So hopefully that um yeah I think she can stop your share. How do I stop it? Okay. <laughs> it's on the top of the oh yes uh, the yeah, screen. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's it. Thank you, Ankush. Yeah. Um. So the um program uh we will have a short lunch break and the, the afternoon sessions will resume at one one p.m. Um. Hopefully that um. You guys will enjoy the morning sessions. I enjoyed our um, keynote speak um, speech from Dr. Wei, sharing with uh, like uh, uh, latest technologies on federated learnings. Um, 
and therefore all the uh, five papers um, for, for all the authors who contributed into this conference. And uh, thank you so much. And we will see you again at one o'clock, uh, 1 p.m., which is 27 minutes left. <laughs> so hopefully there'll be enough time for you guys to have a lunch, have a quick lunch. Yeah, thank you. And uh, we'll be back. Thank you.
Good afternoon, everyone. This is you speaking. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, cool. Uh, so welcome back to the afternoon session of Trading Calm 2022. Well, we hope you have enjoyed the quick lunch. We are terribly sorry for the tight uh, schedule because we, we hope all the authors from different countries are able to attend it. If they want, <laughs> then in the afternoon session, we have totally six papers for presenting. And then there will be a best paper announcement, which is followed by the closing of this conference. And for the first paper, uh, the authors are not able to come. They send through an email and let me know. And they also sent through their video. Previously, they planned to present by themselves, but sadly, uh, they can only <coughs> uh, play the video for us. Uh, but this video is not uh, processed by the EAI publisher. However, I have checked the contents. It's totally suitable for a conference presentation. Okay, so I will play the first video for you guys. <clears throat> Just one moment. Hello everyone. The report I'm sharing today is implementation of my own digital ERC for 100 base effects. The report will be explained from five aspects, background, related work, method, results, and contribution. First, let's go over the background. Larger based FX data receiver system based on optical fiber communication is widely used to realize 100 megabits per second internet connection in industries with high reliability requirements. 100 based FX communication systems are generally implemented based on supply chips. As shown in this diagram, the 100 based FX system consists of three components fiber optic transceiver, standalone 100 based FX supply chip, and MAC. For fiber optic transceiver, it converts optical signals to LVPS. The standalone 100 base FX fly chip converts LVPS signals to RMII or MII. And the MAC receives internet messages from RMII or MII timing. The picture on the right shows an actual 100 base FX communication system. Here on the left,
In order to turn on uniform data stream post by clock or data jitter into a uniform, uninterrupted data stream, we need to design a rate balancing unit. The fiber write control circuit uses a nine bit left word shift register. For example, suppose valid zero is a circuit, then data zero will be shifted into the shift register. Due to the mismatch between the clock and the data rate, two bits or one bit may shift into the shift register per cycle. So we need a nine bit shift register. When the shift register contains only eight bits data, we write the lower eight bits to the FIFO. Otherwise, we write the upper eight bit data to the FIFO instead. All cases are shown in the picture. The ability of the proposed LUTERC to tolerate the different slow and fast computer depends on the FIFO use double word value in the rate balance logic. For the FIFO use double word signal, having a larger or smaller value is far better. If the value is too small, there is a risk that the FIFO will be read empty and the SNS packet uh, data will be interrupted when the data rate at the receptive side is slower than the local clock rate. Relationships between use double word and the MT clock gesture capability is defined by equation 1 and 2. According to the equations, when the 5 for use double word signal is 48 bits, LUTDRC has the same resistance to fast and slow clock jitter, allowing the symbol wise to be lengthened by 0.0312 nanoseconds or shortened by 0.0315 nanoseconds, respectively. Such a jitter resistance is multiple times higher than the IEEE standard. Here is the results of our experiment. We implemented our LUTDRC algorithm on the Mango ETL25 body. The figure on the left shows the layout of the place and route. The resource utilization is shown in the table. From the table, LUTDRC utilized only 470 LUT6 and has a low power consumption of 10 megawatts. Simulation results with minus 0.04 nanoseconds and positive 0.032 nanoseconds jitter in the transmit clock are shown in the picture. It shows the jitter resistance of our algorithm. When the symbol period is shortened to 7.96 nanoseconds or extended to 8.032 nanoseconds, Due to the clock jitter, the LUTDCR and the receiver side can still recover the original data and restore the symbol period to 8 nanoseconds. It shows that the LUTDRC has a higher clock jitter resistance than the IEEE standard. When the transmitter clock cycle is less or greater than 8 nanoseconds, 2 bits or 0 bits data will be recovered during this cycle to balance the clock jitter. The data valid signal, the out valid, in such case is shown as a cycle 2 in the picture above. Our test environment is shown in the diagram. A 100 base 5 transceiver is implemented based on LUTDRC then connected to the network tester and the internal MAC of the FPGA. The test structure is shown in the picture. During the test, the network tester sends a 64 bytes, the bit error 448 error rate, 830 bytes during the whole 1,216 bytes and 1,518 bytes Sends Ethernet messages to the test board with a minimum frame interval of 96 bits. 
The data received by the test board will go to LUTERC and MAC, then loop back to the tester. Results are shown in the table. As shown in the table, both bit error rate and the CRC error rate are zero during the whole test. Under the extreme conditions specified by the Internet data message protocol, according to our simulation and experiment results, our LUTDRC algorithm has a simple logic structure, less resource utilization and power consumption, and a higher anti clock jet performance than I3800 for space specification. And that's all. Thank you for your listening. Uh, we will thank your authors for presenting their research on how to implement uh, all digital DRC for this kind of protocol. And uh, since the authors are not here, so if you are interested, you can uh, put your questions in the chat box. So I can forward them to the authors, or you can directly send through an uh, email. Uh, so nice. Uh, I believe the authors are more than welcome to answer any questions regarding this particular research. Okay, so uh, let's move on to the next paper. Uh, so we will welcome Dr. Nai Wang from Deakin University to present his research on a robust NFT assistant knowledge distillation framework for edge computing. Apparently, Dr. Nai prefers to present by himself rather than a pre recorded video. So <clears throat> You can go ahead when you are ready, Dr. Wang. Yep, uh, just a second. Just let me share my screens now. Ah, yep. Yep, can you see my screen? So, yep. Yep. So I'm gonna just uh, start it. Yep. All right, so hello everyone. I'm gonna give you a brief uh, presentation about what we have achieved recently regarding a robust NFT assist knowledge distillation framework framework for edge computing. Um, yeah, just a little bit about the background. So first one, what is the knowledge distillation? Um, it is the method that we that allows us to perform the normal um model like um, classification within the end devices, especially with the uh, H devices, which is uh, not that powerful to perform a full training of the normal model. And within the knowledge installations or um, KD for short, there's a two core points. The first one is the teacher model, which we can regard it as a normal uh, model training process that can be performed onto a normal machines. Whereas for another core point is the student's models, which is generated by the teacher's model accordingly, um, so that the student model not requiring any uh, specially training process, so that that can be performed down to the end devices with the lower computational power. And so that's triggering one of the problem is like um, with the training onto the teacher model or the usage of the students models, there's a no protection. So what the model um, values that's been uh, put onto whatever the training machines or the end devices. So that, that is the key point that we want to improve within this work. And other than um, the KD, we just uh, want to introduce another mechanism that's um, allow us to giving a sort of protections over the models, which is the pro uh, the blockchains um, po possibly used by many other papers. But just uh, here, I just want to illustrate some of the basic source within the blockchain. So first of all, it is the um, dependencies that's maintained between one block and another. So that's any changes within, within one block could be easily figured out by other blocks as well as the ledgers. So the typical process could be once a request um, injected to any of the blockchain's nodes, I placed down to the left screens of this slide. Um, 
that cutoff request could be forward to generating the new block and all the following block will be generated followed by the dependencies of the current one so that's there there will be no allowance on to any uh, malicious changes with the value of within those blocks so that the protection can be performed overall and in this paper, we just uh, also use another implementations over the blockchain that is the NFT or the non fungible non fungible token uh, with some other paper referred. Um, yeah, so let's see how it's performed within our framework. The first of all, the teacher training epochs that, as I mentioned, there's the first training process is for the teacher model uh, within each of the training epoch. Um, we're just generating the corresponding NFTs and have the features of that model recorded onto the blockchains so that we can verify, literally verify whether the teacher's model is being affected by malicious attackers or, or not um, throughout uh, checking the value store onto the NF NFT generators on blockchain if um, matched or not. So the same concept can be applied with the student's model. Uh, within the student's performing or training process, we can generate in the NFTs as well for each of the uh, student's model so that we can check whether they're going to be affected or is there a necessity that we're recovering some of the student model from the blockchain NFT directly. And um, this slide just is showing some of the core points for the uh, normal KD, but uh, with our NFT solutions modifications. So the first point needs to be noticed is within whatever the teacher's training process or the student's training process, we're just putting a check mechanism inside of it. Uh, so that's for each of the training process, we can check with the blockchain directly to see whether the current model is being affected or to loading the most, um, the latest optim, optimum model directly from the blockchains. And within each of the training process, if we figure out that a model achieves better than the previous, we just recorded that as the so far best model onto the blockchains and cre creating a corresponding NFT directly through this kind of modifications. And also we keep a copy of that model into our local environment so that we can easily um, cache some, some um, the optimum model um, away from the NFT so that we can faster loading it. But anyway, uh, for all, all of the training process, we're still looking at the blockchain directly so that we can see if that model got gonna be um, affected by the malicious attackers. So that is the major algorithm for our framework. And other than that, I also want to introduce some of the data structure that we put onto the NFT generations. Ah, uh, sorry. Yep, on the... On this table, um, the first column illustrates all the data needed with the um, teacher's model. And in the middle, it is the student model. So that's where you just easily aggregate everything within the data structure to generate a specific NFTs onto the blockchains. So that's gonna say um, there's no difference that the NFTs that generates on the blockchain to specify whether it is the uh, teacher model or student model, uh, which is the point that we're going to improve in the later uh, research. And all of the um, MT associated actions or operations are uh, scripted by the Web3 techniques, which is the smart contract directly scripts within Solidity language and deploys onto the Block, public blockchains, which is uh, another feature of our work. That is for some other work, I just I suppose uh, some of other work using the private private chains, which is uh, um, not that 
are fashionable with the NFT world or the blockchain world, because uh, I think the trust is the most things we want to keep from the public. So that's we're using the public chain to perform our work instead. Yep, and just uh, for some as our as our announcements with our title of our work, uh, we want to provide some protections or robustness over the um, external attractions. So that's we just perform some uh, robustness validations over by um, comparing to some other papers and comparing by own own model. So the first table just showing the running results when once we are comparing with another paper with the where the notation is placed here. So the MINIST and CIFA are ten are the two um, data sets that we use to evaluate our model uh, by uh, comparing to other models. The first one, the MINIST, we just uh, achieved a rather similar um, accurate, overall accuracy around 98.8 or 99, which is uh, rather similar to the model that we compared. But once there is something under attack with our framework. I think our model just uh, over um, outperform about their overall accuracies by nearly 4%. And the same trends happens within the CFA uh, 10 data sets as well. So that it is a, so, um, it is a illustration that our model have um, achieved better than the other model that we compared. And since it is a very, there is a very limited works existed within the data distillation, knowledge distillations, um, robustness evaluations work. So that's we also perform a self comparison. Um, the running results is showing within the following table. Uh, the table is showing the major results that's running after 500 training epochs. So each of the um, line item di displaying the overall accuracies um, after the 500 training epochs. Um, and the first column illustrates the attacks number, which growing from 10, uh, sorry, which growing from zero, which is the baseline that's for comparisons and 10, 50, 100, 200, and 300. And the uh, parentheses and close is the where the attractions happen in the T does as meaning the attacks happened within the both teachers and students model. And the T itself is meaning the teachers and S itself is meaning students only. So here we can see some of the interesting, um, interesting points. So with the attack number of zero, and attacks with the teacher, both teachers and students, we achieved the worst um, overall accuracy around 98. But if the attack chance only happens onto the student's model, uh, we can have a slightly gain within the overall accuracy by 0.29. And also the attacks, once the attack only happens within the teacher's model, we just say slightly uh, worse gain by 0.08. So it is the telling us the attractions happens onto the student model, just um, not that sens sensitive to the attractions onto the teacher's model. Or to say the attack, if a attraction happens onto a teacher's model, it gets worse than the attractions onto the student model. So the same trend can be figured out onto the CFA or 10 data sets as well. And so as the, the attack number rise to 300 or out of 500 training epochs, I think our model still provide a certain amount of robustness over 90% of overall accuracies in minutes and um, above 85% of accuracy for CIFAR on 10 data sets. So, which is a strong supportive announcement that our more, uh, proposed framework can provide a certain amount of robustness um, to the origin 
uh, KD framework. All right. Um, and the further work can be addressed within the improvement with the Web3 developments and um, to reducing the network communication costs. And also, the, we can implement a more like the policy selection so where the different scheme of attacks happened. So that is a possibly of uh, future work that's going to be conducted. So um, I think that is much of my presentation. Uh, thanks for watching. And now is the question time, if there is any. Thanks, Dr. Noi, for the excellent presentation. Uh, I can tell you well uh, integrated to advanced technologies, and it looks like a really practical framework. Uh, so any questions for Dr. Wong? Yep, thanks. <laughs> it's probably a really uh, quite different research topic compared with other authors of this conference. Okay, so if there's no specific questions, we will uh, move on to the next stage. And we, is that all right, Dr. Wang? <laughs> yeah, just to stop my sharing. Ah, oh, cool. Sorry. That's no problem. Thanks, thank you very much. <clears throat> okay, uh, for the next paper, it's mainly about uh, the, uh, a research and implementation of importing distributed cluster data into cloud platform based on GMIs. And this paper is will be presented by uh, authors from Suzhou City University. They also pre-recorded a video. So I will directly uh, play the video. Is that all right? Uh, I saw the author is online. Hi, Ms. Zheng, are you there? Oh, yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Nice to meet you. Uh, so, if you nice don't to meet mind, you too. <laughs> I will just play the video and see if there are any questions for you. Is that all right? Okay, thank you. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, let me share my screen first. <clears throat> okay, so if you can't hear me, please feel free to let me know because there are some technical problems. <laughs> My name is Xu Yuan Zhen. I'm from Suzhou City University of China. I'm very honored to join this conference to share my presentation here. The topic of my presentation is a short slide. Research and implementation of importing distributed cluster data into cloud platform based on GMS. My presentation will include four parts. First part, some background information introduction. Second part, method is about the main work we have done. It's mainly about game demonstration and selection, system design and implementation. Third part is the research results. And in the last part, some conclusions we have got. About the instruction. With the rapid growth of the system service volume, the traditional single machine deployment form is unable to meet various needs. At this time, the stupid cluster deployment mode arises. The cluster environment is a good choice for improving the business processing capacity. However, with the further development of the internet technology, more and more systems are migrating to the cloud because the cloud platform is cheaper, more stable, more secure, and more scalable. Our project is to import the data in a PM system into a cloud platform. So, this paper mainly introduces 
the ace of Reliance message processing technology based on GMS prevent different users in the distribute fast system from selecting incoming records for concurrent submission and import. The main thing technology are about GMS web service in this stretch to realize the aim. Java message service is a specification proposed by SunTV, which provides a set of interfaces independent of a specific implementation. And it is used to connect two application programs or send messages in a distributed system. Web service is the interaction between network applications based on the HTTP protocol through the internet. The main work what we have done can be summarized as theme demonstration and selection, system design and implementation. For the theme demonstration and selection, three solutions were studied and designed during the development of this project. The solutions in person are listed as shown. Theme one is creating a static array list because the static array list is stored in the mesh area of the Java virtual machine. The elements contained in the master area are always unique in the whole program and are shared by the whole spread. This solution has no problem for a single machine system, but no suitable for a distributed process system according to the web logic. The distributed process system is composed of one enemy node and one or more slave nodes. And the system is deployed on each node. So there will be a static array list of each node. That is, there will be multiple static arrays lists exist at the same time. And if the record, such as the DFCO ID, our research is submitted on different nodes. It will only exist in the state array list of the corresponding node. Multiple state arrays lists cannot be compared to a certain duplicate record. Scheme 2. The popular message queues RabbitMQ, RocketMQ, and ActiveMQ are used to control the submitted the records through message queues. Then the GR package of corresponding message queue needs to be added and should only generate. At the same time, the service of a message queue needs to be deployed and maintained. It needs a lot of changes. And if the big changes needs a lot of effort. Moreover, the important function is highly dependent on the message queue service. Once there is a problem with the message queue service, the import function cannot be used, and no backup message queue is available. Scheme 3 As our product is deployed with web logic, WebLogic has very powerful functions as an application server. It has its own GMS service. User can configure the GMS service to realize the function from the message queue. The GMS function is similar to Scheme 2's working principle of the message queue. In this scheme, the code changes are minor. 
Meanwhile, the logic has the functions of a redundant backup and automatic failover for the server where GMS is located goes down. It will automatically change one of the slave nodes into a new admin node. At the same time, move all service to the new admin node, including the configured GMS service. In this way, the system can be issued to have high availability in the actual project application. It can also play the role of a data disaster recovery backup. So, through the comparison of the above three schemes, it can be seen that these three can solve the problem of repeat data submission with minimum changes in the existing technology and successfully realize the import of the cloud platform data. Therefore, this solution is selected for our project. For system design and implementation, for a matter of time, I will make a brief description about it. The specific architecture block diagram of this project system is shown here. The distributed processor system of the project is shown in the left block. It is composed of a load balance server, enemy nodes, and multiple slave nodes, which are deployed on the web logic server, and the GMS service is deployed on the enemy node. The red block is the cloud platform system. This distributed cloud system integrates data through web service to import data to the cloud platform. And Java message service is only deployed on the admin node. It is unique in the distributed processing system. Next is about configuration for JMS. It has two ways. The first way, parameter allocation method, modifying the web logic configuration file on the server side of the corresponding distributed system can realize the role of deploying web service on the web logic. And the GMS server in the admin nodes config.xml file can reach this. The second way, console configuration method. Then the corresponding domain and the domain structure of the web logic node. Go to the service and then enter the GMS server and the message to create GMS for load from step by step. That is also carried to a function. For cloud platform data import, define the web service objects in the Bristol file of the cloud platform. Then build job file generated by input violation and put it into the distributed system server. At the same time, import the key store in the Bristol file of the cloud platform into the distributed system. Generally speaking, the web service operations are mainly divided into two steps. The first step is search and query function. The distributed cluster system access the cloud platform system and the cloud platform query data in the distributed cluster system and Mapping the attributes in the distributed system 
to a migrate with the attribute of the corresponding cloud and cloud web service. Data import is the second step. This step imports data from the distributed cloud system to the cloud platform. The web service corresponding to the cloud platform is copied on the distributed system side. Operations and messages are described. And then, then Dodai's XML is used for message transmission. Then, research results. We can see from three figures in the figure one, creating a new EFCO 0, 0, 0 to find object at the distributed cluster system size and adding the attachment file on the, this object. Then there is P O O O O P R T S P O O O O O three dot P R W the two atomic files which designed by they deployed were on the publishable space of the tab of this project is in the distributed system. Configuration the GMS service and web service with this intersection of web logic. After that, this project to associate with the cloud platform. Then migrate the two records to the cloud platform. If another user logs in the distributed cloud systems to other clients and submits the imported records repeatedly, the warning message collected roles is being published and cannot be added to a new job. Collected roles not being published will be added to a new job. Will pop up on the user's interface as shown in figure two. Duplicate records will not send to the GMS message queue, which plays a role in preventing duplicate submission. And if the corresponding records successfully imported to the corresponding items in the cloud platform, the results will show as in figure three. You can see all the item objects just imported under the order objects corresponding to the cloud platform. And the relationship has been successfully imported as well. Last part about inclusion. This paper proposed a specific communication method for importing distributed cluster system data into the cloud platform based on web logic GMS and the web service technology. When importing data, the problem of duplicate submission of compared data is effectively prevented through web logic GMS. And as regards of innovation, I think it is not only since the development cycle, but also is easy to realize. Thus, improving the production efficiency and quality of the software. Okay, that's all for my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Very great talk. Many thanks, Ms. Zheng. Uh, so is there any question for Ms. Zheng and uh, her team? Okay, so probably I've got a quick question. 
Uh, so I can see this is a research on importing distributed cluster data into cloud platform. And as you can see, uh, edge computing currently is a really a hot topic and has been developed for decades. So uh, have you considered to extend this kind of research to the edge side? Uh, yes, um, I, I, think we, we, I think we can continue to simulate the good get uh, Okay, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I think the connection is not quite good and there are some noise uh, from your side. Okay, okay. How about now? Uh, uh, I think there's still, there still some noise there. <laughs> Uh, how about now? Oh, yeah, that's much better. That's much better. Uh, okay, I think that we, we can continue to research the area about this uh, uh, function about uh, uh, immigrating the distribute data to uh, the other platform. Uh, we will continue to do that. It's a good question for you about, about this research area. No worries. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Chen. Uh, any further questions from our audience? Okay, I feel, I feel there's a no. <laughs> okay, thanks again, Ms. Chen, <laughs> for your great presentation. Okay, thank you. No worries. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Then we will just go ahead. Uh, our next paper will be... Uh, sorry. Let me see where I did. <laughs> it will be web bot detection based on hidden features of HTTP access log. Uh, so I can think this is presented by a bunch of authors from both research academia and industry partners. Uh, I think I, we also have authors online. So uh, Dr. Wang, do you mind if I just go ahead and play the video and then we probably have some questions for you? Okay, I assume that's a yes. <laughs> uh, just one moment, I will share a screen of this video. Okay, let's get started. Today I would like to provide a study of what to do with so and For examples, we can also call it kidnap robot or artificial. According to statistics from Jive Global the reports indicate 43.3 of all internet use on one or on post. Of course, there is some other search engine as a liquid account. So we can call them good form. However, the database may be double. So the article carries double points of the street. Or to other malicious activities against the particular provider process and also damage them to the privacy. Every company in the world is very fast to recognize the process. The provider is using the problem. Uh, some common tool I introduced is the capture JavaScript challenge, with the menu, firewall, fingerprint, connection. Uh, for example, that one is not capture. Capture is mass and paper. So, as you can see, that is a good thing. Me personally, it's very good. But my use of the tools actually is very good. Because the key is to avoid the problems. Firstly, you will need to distinguish this form from the text. That means some authors. And those algorithms nowadays just not actual or not accurate enough to finish them. 
lot of recent research. Uh, the researchers and do not need to see their findings. Due to the nature of the behaviors and factors, this claim that they can have that the This question then tells us nothing from my perspective. For our research, we have extracted a new function of the um, from the one of the objects and it allows us to realize the answer the first question. Our method is based on the whole computer and is used to find the other features. Let's start with the uh, raw data distribution. In order to clustering of distributed sensors from robot, we ex expect them to exhibit two distinct cluster distributions and geometries. However, the bubbles are generally building on the different logic, which is not interesting to developers, and this enters the distribution. As you can see, the data distribution, which are features of the environment. The blue point indicates that human samples are labeled as zero, and the brown point are labeled later as one. The human distribution cover a fine geometry, but the bubbles show the various complex distributions. So given the both patterns complex it was a very different intent to doing a different job and uh, maybe have different objective. One bot can be very different than another. So we will need to find the final features to help to distinguish both objects. We can find the data distributions of bubbles are scattered and do not have broad geometry characteristics. Hence, it is bring more difficult to use to the cluster and humans to plot directly based on distance, for example, breathing distance. Historical clustering based methods are proposed to solve the clustering problem with non Euclidean distance, for example, kilometer clustering for promoting historic distance strategy. In each observation star, its own cluster. And the cluster are successfully merged together. However, we found that either directly using A means, which is leading babies, or monitoring cluster on the raw data of HTTPXS logs is not possible. At the right hand side of this picture, uh, it shows a human and bubble prediction for the performance, and the monitoring cluster is shown for. The results show that either gradient uh, or non gradient is uh, sufficient to classify the human and the body based on raw data. Lots of bubble samples are discredited for the human. So, in this case, we will use the auto encoder based on user finding the hidden feature first, then use like this gaming to cluster those features. In this research, we proposed a way using autoencoder based method to find the hidden features on the HTTPXS log, which significantly plus all the samples of the level together and clearly distinguish them from the others. So, in the equation one, the encoder block then has a nonlinear classification, which is mapping inputs index into the latent space of the loading machine. Um, here, the activation function W and V indicate the 
as for those at the fires through the fire of Uber that the later back says it contains the critical information as this impactful sample of acts similar to others and should have similar life benefit which is beneficial. Therefore, we can use the encoded block to extract similar header features from the scattered distribution tables, enabling uh, these features embedding the network global to adjacent locations in a low dimension space. And uh, moreover, the equation to the decoder block is a non-linear classification of zip address. Uh, here, activation function. Uh, which returns either features between zero and one. As we get the decode output X header, we can define the loss function of appropriate uh, X header to the row identity with this X. After we train the audio encoder model, we can directly use the final learning method from the encoder block for the clustering and predicting uh, the corresponding labels. Uh, experiment and the evaluation. The encoder blob uh, generates a two example head of feature embedding. The red point indicates the human and the blue point are the rebels. In the figure A, uh, the embedding of human and rebels are slightly geometric and easy to cluster by the key names. But in the figure B, the angle of geometry head is Cursing the clustering difficulty in those dimension space. That another problem is that we map the features in the low dimension space. The distribution of the features has been found by numerical randomness in the human network. Hence, we curse uh, and the geometry shift represent the levels of dimensions. So the distance sometimes do not distance. We use a simple location and to dominate the head of the figures against vision. The low dimension that is a unique dimension for each school. The equation for transportation has The I is the radius and the data is We have uh, evaluated the polar particles and the particles and the points. Flat points are uh, in the center, so that the middle points are the lower centers. We can find that most of the points are either represented by this So in the figure A, I shows the pattern. And uh, in the figure B, it shows the values of the labels, the direction of the files, and the figure C, it shows the key information from after the quarter of the indicating the most members successfully distributed. We validated our master to also use. Some other uh, popular plastic masters in this area. Uh, let's start with this K-mix. The K-mix is very popular in the business case master, uh, well known and common use of plastic master, which is frequently used as the least common use of plastic master in the search. And the C-mix, which is closer to plastic master. Which is the distance based on the weight. To report to the number of fires that we have used, the train sheets and exposure is based on the design of the human system. 
all the other stuff too. And the, the game, the game of the game, the fun thing, it's a lot of fun story. Now, which is not only the play, but it's the instructions. This all our place now has after the map, which is the value of the best justification of the points. So all that is said, and here it is the best answer. And also if you put there the points for the whole test. The average accuracy of the points is the map is the best highest level. Well, the wing shape is the longest. Also, the wing shape is the best of the problem. How many points does the problem It has a problem that's vector so many per percent. We also did experiment by SDP. Now, which one actually admires the most? And eventually, we get the most one percent. So in contrast, the other has the The average classification risk is about 11 percent of the risk and identification of the in the of the chain. Um, our purpose is to have a similar feature but all Looks like a very promising solution for the number of problems. Through this research, we propose the alternative for the list of number of dimensions, which is used to actually get the previous information that we have sent. Experiment construction. The future work. Uh, thank you for listening. Very impressive talk. Thank you very much, Kevin. So, Kevin, are you there? You're online right now? I am. Oh, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Okay, so uh, is there any question for Kevin regarding this particular research? No. <laughs> good. Okay. We are clear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That means you make really clear presentation. Yeah, I think the idea of this research is quite easy to follow, and the results looks quite promising. That's great. And even without deep learning uh, algorithms, the accuracy of your proposed model is over ninety nine percent. Right. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's saying when we talk about machine learning, usually if if the result is higher than eighty percent, we consider that is fake. But uh -huh. our model, we actually, yeah, we actually achieve very insane accuracy. Yeah. Um, from what the evaluation method we do, and uh, yeah, that looks like very pro promising for this area because you know the both activities. Uh, it's behave quite be different from each other, but from high level is actually um, have a very clear feature which is different than the humans, and uh, so that's why we can uh, figure out it's very efficient and uh, hopefully this can help for some other researcher or some company can uh, build some algorithm or program uh, application on top of that and uh, we can have more. Good protection for the cybersecurity. 
Yeah, yeah, sounds great. I think definitely this will be quite useful in real world cases. Thank you much. Thank you very much, Kai Yuan. Thank if, you. Yeah, if we don't have any questions, then we will move on to our second last paper. And regarding this paper, uh, the, the title is, uh, it's quite long. <laughs> uh, so just one moment, let me check where, where is the video. <laughs> okay, I've got it. Let me share my screen first. Okay, so our next paper will be a game based real time convert energy shift attack against data driven detectors. Uh, apparently, this is a paper uh, that discusses the security vulnerabilities in a smart meter scenario. So, uh, I see our author Jinan is online. Hi, how are you, Jinan? Are you there? Uh, yes, I am. <laughs> okay, nice to meet you. So, uh, if you don't mind, I will play the video first as usual, and then let's see if there are any questions for you. Is that all right? Uh, yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thanks. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm Chunan Ying. I'm from Hainan University of Science and Technology in China. I'm honored to be able to participate in this conference. The topic of my conference is GAN based real-time convert analysis attack against big dragon detectors. My report is mainly based on the following parts. At first, is the background, then the system structure, experiments and evaluations, and finally is the conclusion. The background is mainly divided into two parts, the effect of analysis and unresolved challenges. As early as 2019, unreceived cost unit companies to lose more than 90 billion pounds per year. Besides, more than 80% of the people paid bills to malicious electric received users without their knowledge. Such losses are usually irreversible and large amounts for the individual and the providers. Electric power companies analyze the characteristics of unreceived users through the large amount of customer historical data accumulated by smart grid. Some detection algorithms, such as support water machine, logistic regression, random forest, algorithm and uh, DNA classification can be used to evaluate the suspected and receive probability of users and uh, provide evidence for suspected and received based on outlier analyzed method. However, this method only considers for a time due to imbalanced data size the distribution of most attack symbols is not convert enough. So the recognition accuracy of the tree model is not generalized enough and the robustness is poor. Therefore, it's necessary to find more convert attack methods of unreceived to develop an efficient and reliable detection system. To solve these problems, we propose a covert attack model based on conditional generative adversarial network. The generative adversarial network was initially introduced by Goodfellow and is now widely utilized in object 
identification, thematic segmentation, images creation, and uh, value, value prediction. Again, is a two-person network or generator and a discriminator. The former aims to simulate and uh, learn the distribution of real data as much as possible. Render points of potential variables are then reconstructed to produce real world examples. The discriminator is used to distinguish between raw data and the generated data. The paper of ADV GAN generated various adversarial examples without accessing the target model. The third people, the third paper added a potential feature injection block based on ADV GAN, which effectively reduced the number of tuning rods for the model and improve the attack success rate of the attack samples. Lob GAN improving the convergence speed of GAN training and the quality of the generating adversarial examples. The CGAN based attack generation model contains a feature injector F, a generator G, and a discriminator D. Firstly, the feature injector injects the data feature features FX that the malicious detection model focuses on during the detection process. Then we utilize these injected features and a generator to generate adversarial projections that can mislead malicious detection models. Gaussian noise is selected for random noise. Finally, add the raw data and the generated disturbance to make the adversarial examples more stancy. In our method, the feature injector, generator, and the discriminator are trained end to end. We designed the following optimization to optimize the parameters. The generator and the discriminator are constantly competing. The process can be defined as function as follow. Model comp computation achieved Nash equilibrium and no training. Okay, let's turn to the experiments and the evaluations. The evaluation part selects three indicators, AUC, FAT, and uh, recall. AUC is often used to evaluate the classification accuracy. MAP is used to measure the accuracy of the hybrid detection model. Using the recall to evaluate the detection rate of positive samples. After testing the attack deep side, it has shown that our approach has better performance in evading existing advanced detection methods. At attack day rights, the fluctuation of AUC and MAP value is small. The, effecti the effectiveness of the generated attack samples in long term electricity stealing can be verified. The generative network models convergence speed and the training time may both be significantly accelerated by feature injector. When the number of neurons in the feature injector's fully connected layers reaches 300, the AUC and MAP values of the detection model are both low, and the attack samples generated by the generative network model are close to the real data. 
to the number of the generator network layers in the generative model is three. The generated attack samples have a strong ability to evade detection, and the attack performance is better. Finally, made a conclusion. Our main contributions are as follow. We proposed a convert real-time attack method based on CGAN, which misleads the anomaly detection system by adding perturbations to electricity stealing data, and the generated attack symbols can invade existing mainstream detection methods. We utilized a feature extraction model to extract the latent features of the daily electricity consumption data as a period for the generator. Making training the generator and the discriminator easier so that we can obtain a higher attack success rate with fewer training approaches. In the future, first, uh, we will consider the adversarial defense to detect the energy safe. Furthermore, we plan to add privacy protection content to the model. Okay, thanks for listening. Many thanks. Many thanks for the great talk. Uh, so, Jinan, uh, is there any question for Jinan? Okay, so uh, we don't have any questions in the chat box either. Yeah, uh, probably I have a quick question for you, Jinan. Uh, so, uh, regarding regarding this particular research, you mentioned that you use scan to generate some synthetic data for uh, experimental purpose. So, would you please uh, better explain like why 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 do why you guys don't use the raw data but choose the synthetic data instead? Okay. Thanks for asking. Uh, let me see. Hi, Jinan. Uh, I think we can uh, hear you. <laughs> uh, sorry, I, I can't ex express myself well uh, in uh, English. Uh, <laughs> I'd like to discuss it uh, with you after the uh, session. Are you okay? okay, yeah, that's no problem. Uh, uh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so so if you if other audience you, you got any question for Jinan, you can also send emails to the authors to, to Jinan and his team, or you can uh, leave a message to me and I will forward the questions to them as well. Okay, uh, that's no problem. Thanks, Jinan. Thanks for the great talk. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Oh, good. And now we have one last paper to present uh, for the whole conference. And the last paper that will be presented is entitled A Survey on 3D Style Transfer. And this paper will be presented by uh, authors, also from Suzhou City University. And the first author is Feng Qi. Uh, Hi, how are you, Feng? Are you there? Okay, probably not, or probably you forgot to unmute yourself. Uh, okay, that's not a big problem. Uh, we will start with playing the video first, and then we will see if there are any questions for Feng. Oh, we will see. Uh, oh, she's not online. Is she online? Nope. <laughs> That's all good. Okay, let's start with the video. <laughs> oh. 
how I was searching how I'm searching how you transfer. Image style transfer is a popular and a widely studied class in computer version. And it aims to apply the style of the source image to the classic one. Style transfer is widely used in creating new images in two dimensional. But the style transfer in three images still has many challenges. In this paper, we summarize the major exciting methods of 3D style transfer, including traditional and narrow network-based approaches. Moreover, we discuss the application skills and the future research direction in 3D style transfer. What is the 3D style transfer? We have two sorts of 3D images. We separate the star and the content of one 3D image source. Then we combine the content of one source with the star of the other. After that, we see the results. Why do we make a research in 3D style transfer? Because we can use it in certain ways to improve our life experience. Firstly, in medicine field, we can use 3D transfer to make a large amount of 3D medical image data, which is essential to diagnose or evaluate diseases through machine learning. Secondly, 3D style transfer is widely used in VR and AR field as well as in video game industry. We can use 3D style transfer to generate buildings and create characters. In this way, it reduces the workload of animation modeling. As we see, it is useful in our daily lives. So we trust how to realize it. We have two main ways. One is through non neural network transfer. For instance, Chen and the Pistero make that transfer through decomposing the, the 3D model into parts, then restructuring them with similar visual structure. In contrast, Hibiero and Hispero resemble the individual parts based on the style of and Hispero proposed an analog driver based 3D style transfer. To apply the style feature of an example to the target one in 3D field. This method is inspired by cognitive science. It works well on creating 3D models for geometric shapes. Another way is through machine learning. We also divided it into two different directions. One is decompose and reconstruct, and other is toward 3D net as we have a lot of formal researchers in two-dimensional images by transfer. The decomposed and the reconstructed way is decomposing 
the three D images into two images through different ways. Then we choose the certain ways to make light transfer in two dimensional images. After that, we construct with the paths to rebuild the 3D image. This method has good results in the texture. For instance, Chen and his fellow used this method to make a 3D architecture style transfer that we can see on this chart. Chen and uh, they construct the transport parts to rebuild a new 3D image. To realize 3D style transfer in machine learning is towards 3D net, different from 2D image data, which is usually represented as pixels. The representation of 3D images are point clouds, flashes, and so on. As a result, users who make a style transfer through 3D narrow network directly need to choose or create a 3D net first. He summarized the common shape representations of 3D style transfer, which corresponds to the 3D net, including point cloud, surface net, and so on. Choose those point net for real life 3D style transfer, right? However, different from original the first one is the house of the and the second one is the body. They are used to in a basic 3D net structure, based on graph matrix is also connected. However, the regular graph matrix in 3D net structure form has no link result. The result for both standard form graph matrix. The style loss family is smaller for the small group than for the scale. To avoid that effect by using correspondence, yeah, the such a based on graph matrix of point and the auxiliary state to supervise. Matia and his fellow proposed the unsupervised 3D net style transfer mode, which addressed by the inside dependent generative model that adopt and that and the mesh flow. He called it generative style dependent on his tools. Then we discuss the mutual research direction of 3D transform. Number one, optimum and the parameter of optimization. In order to obtain stylized and ideal image results, it is necessary to carefully adjust the parameters sequentially based on the model optimization. After each adjustment of model parameters, the model needs to be retrieved. Moreover, the model of a neural network can be optimized. Therefore, 
how to them and the paramedicine how mechanization is a proper way it to the further development of patient Number two, model optimization. In contrast, we are color and the temperature are the dominant touches in the diet. The presentation of three images are point of attention. Therefore, the direct symmetry of diet changes the shape of the original. And next, textual detail information. Currently, the three instructions of action is networks. Realize the transformation of texture and shape, respectively. The final results are super enforced data. Finding new 3D data patterns or optimization. Basic models creating new 3D neural network, which can transform the structure and the surfaces of 3D models at the same time. It is also a research direction for future exploration. Number three, optimal evaluation. 3D structures for Usually, we have an objective evaluation method. Some researchers have invited the volunteers to explore the image after the slide. This method has a advantage. When it is that there are not enough volunteers and the sample size is not large enough to complete the study. On the other hand, the results are attacked by personal preference and the lack of objective. So, a standard evaluation method is helpful in understanding how to improve the existing site transport option in the street field. of the method in summarizing this process. Because the four main methods proposed by different authors, we consider the advantages and the disadvantages and we consider the results in this paper. Also, make an overview of major loss changes due to three types of fields. This proposed graph loss, which is traditional and classic, is also used for three fields. Two proposed possible and transfer loss, which is good at the Right, the similarity of the three issues. In this paper, the current application fields of 3D stack transport are analyzed and summarized, as well as the possible research hotspots in the future. Image stack transport based on deep learning is a hot research field. With rapid development, this paper classifies and describes the current research work according to the main principles of image style transport, which can help beginners and researchers in this field grasp the current research direction and deepen their understanding of the research. Thank you. Very impressive. So we are on 3D 
style transfer. Uh, thank you very much, Stephen. So, are you there right now? <laughs> Can you hear me? Uh, well, I'm so sorry, I'm here now. Yes, so yeah. uh, I'm sorry. Um, no, come back online. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so any questions for Jifeng? Probably not. Uh, I think there's a re re relatively practical way on a particular technique that has been used in real world applications that tried to align with our conference. Uh, actually, I, I, I want to ask a question represent of all authors, but I am not an expert in this one and I can hardly ask a, a meaningful question. So probably, you, can, can you please just uh, summarize a few uh, of your current research directions so that uh, see if, the other audience can have a collaboration with you in the future. Just a few dot points is enough. <laughs> so I didn't, sorry, I didn't catch the words. <laughs> oh, sorry, uh, <laughs> my bad. Uh, I mean, uh, I just wondering if you can uh, present uh, a few uh, research directions you are currently working on. Um, oh, okay. Uh, uh, okay. Um, my research is about the uh, 3D style transfer and uh, um, we are looking for a way to um, transfer the objectives um, to a different style uh, that's we are be using many ways to uh, um, to help our and to help um, us to improve our life or something like that. Okay, sounds great. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you very much Sifu, for the great presentation. And this is the last paper of this whole conference. Uh, if there's no further question for Sifu, then we probably move to the next stage. Okay, so the next stage will be uh, best paper announcement. <laughs> so uh, let me share the slides again. <laughs> okay, actually, uh, this should be done by Bruce, the session chair in the morning, but he had some urgent meetings. He had some other issues, so she, he cannot make it. I will uh, uh, present this on behalf of him and the Professor Shui Yu as well. Uh, so, Actually, we have collected uh, several uh, comments from the uh, technical program committee chairs and a broad range of TPC members as well. And uh, based on their voting results, finally, uh, they have decided that the best paper of Tradencom 2022 will be the work presented by uh, Dr. Li Chuan Ma and his team. The title is S FSVM, Federated Support Vector Machines for Smart City. And based on the comments, uh, the reviewers believe that this paper is theoretical, clear, and they have really solid uh, experimental results to support their idea. The idea is novel and interesting. So finally, the award will be uh, granted to Li Chuan and his team. Congratulations. So uh, is there any members here? <laughs> I see a few words. 
Okay, probably not. Uh, probably the, the team members didn't imagine, expect they will receive this best paper reward. That's not a big problem. Uh, we will send through an email to them and let them know. Um, <clears throat> so that's the best paper for the announcement stage. And the last, the last phase of this conference will be a short clothing mark. Actually, this should be done by Bruce as well. Uh, so uh, thanks again for all, all, to our authors for attending this conference and presenting your research. I have read through all the papers and watched all the recordings. I found that the papers and the research presented in uh, this year, in 2022, is really interesting and of some significance. I believe these papers and this research can contribute to both the research community and to the industry as well. And uh, sadly, we are going to close this conference and it is a pity night. We cannot meet physically. Uh, we can only have this kind of online conference during the COVID-19 pandemic period. But uh, anyway, we still, uh, the good point is that we still have this kind of online meeting tools so that we can meet together and exchanging ideas, uh, ideas through this kind of tools. And this is not the end. This will be a new start. Uh, although Trading Camp 2022 is closed, but we still have Trading Camp 2023, right? And the other researchers will hold this conference probably uh, physically somewhere else. We don't know who, we don't know where, where, but definitely there will be trading camp 2023. And if you are still interested, you are more than welcome to submit your novel research results to this conference as well. Um, so thanks again. Thanks again for attending. Thanks for your time. And looking forward to seeing you uh in 2023 that's it thanks bye bye <clears throat>